But let me just kick start by uh, giving some highlight numbers of Alibaba Q3 results. So we can see that the revenue is all going up well. And then the operating income is also um, like fairly good, the results. We can see that the core uh, commerce, right, is like keep on getting like higher. Um, it's just that other segments that is losing money, they continue to lose money. Lah. But in terms of the cash build out, right, it, it, it's, it just like steadily build out a lot of cash. So if they want to do a lot of all this share buyback, they can do that, right? So they have the ability to do that. So if you look at this cash and short-term investment that they have, right, it's about 67 billion US dollar. And Alibaba market cap is currently about 200 billion uh, US dollar. So actually my question, first question I want to pose to uh, Master Leong is that I know you observe uh, Alibaba results quite frequently and what's your what's your observation as what's your uh, commentary in terms of their uh, investment uh, or underlying operating result in the past let's say one two or three quarters now are you happy with the results so far or is it like just meet your expectations or, or yeah I just want to listen yeah, to so comment. actually for the past two uh, quarters uh, investors they were very disappointed with the Alibaba results like the two quarters ago the revenue growth was flat also, then the recent quarter revenue growth is only 3%. So when we look at Alibaba, right, we have to be relative compared to the competitors. Like JD, we saw the revenue growth is 7%. Then Meituan, revenue growth 28%. Pink Total will report the results next week. Analyst expectation is 20 over percent revenue growth. So why is Alibaba growing so much slower than the competitors? So we must think of their product mix. Like for Alibaba, right, their e-commerce is in China, right? It's Taobao and Tianmao. So Taobao is the basic. So people, they still get the basic stuff like toilet paper, instant noodle, their food, all this, uh, and their shampoo, they'll still get it from Taobao. But the Tianmao, the more discretionary spending, like the ones, uh, they are spending less because of the weak economy. For uh, to, uh, for Tianmao, right, their main customer is actually the working class, the office lady, the female. So in the past, they spent a lot like on fashion and also like uh, on their makeup and their cosmetics and health products. But because of the lockdowns and because of the weak economy, right, they are stuck at home. Right? So they don't need to spend to buy new clothes. They don't need to spend uh, to do makeup or this. So discretionary spending is dropped a lot. That's why it affects uh, Alibaba. Like, it's more of a macro environment. Like in the past, China GDP 8%, 7%, 6%. But now this year, the GDP is only expected to go 3.3%. So that's a 3% decline. Although technically it looks like their GDP growth, but fundamentally on the ground, it feels like a recession. Youth unemployment is at 20%. So businesses, they're cutting on spending. They're just trying to survive. Of the weak economy, they tighten their wallets. They don't dare to spend so much. They only dare to spend on their basic needs only. That's why it affects uh, Alibaba so much. Then we look at uh, JD. Why JD got the, look at the JD retail, their core commerce, it still grow at 7%. Why is there the growth still so strong? Because JD, their product mix is very different. They are more heavy on electronics. In like Amazon, it started selling books online. For JD, right, it started as a physical store selling computers. So they are very strong on electronics, then they move online. So for China, right, in the third quarter, the weather was very bad. There was heat wave. So a lot of people, they purchase air conditioner. Uh, then for the local governments, right, because they want to boost the consumer spending. So a lot of these local governments, they have a trial. Lah. They test out uh, by giving consumers coupons. So if they spend 10,000 yuan, they get a 1,500 yuan rebate. So because of the 10,000 yuan spending, right, a lot of these purchase of using the coupon, they go to big items like air conditioner and refrigerator. And why the Chinese, they want to buy refrigerator is also because of the lockdown. Like in Singapore at home, we only have one refrigerator. In China nowadays, it's common to see people have two or even three refrigerator at home. They will go online, buy a lot of the jiaozi. Then the jiaozi, they will all stock up inside the freezer. So uh, air conditioner and refrigerator, the sales of this electronics is very good. That's why JD, the 7% growth. Then Meituan, we see 28% growth is because of the groceries delivery. These are unaffected by the lockdown because it's basic need. So despite lockdown, you can still order from Meituan your, your carrot, your vegetable, your rice, they'll still deliver to you. 
And because of the lockdown, right, they tend to be more kiasu. They will overstock up on the basic needs. That's why May Tuan see very explosive growth. And same for the Ping Toto. Just curious because uh, Alibaba, they also have their um, this grocery business, right? I, I don't know. They I think that one is more on physical groceries, uh, sun Sun Art, I don't know how to pronounce yeah, it. Yeah. So yeah, how, how's how's the business doing there? Uh, do, do they also have all this delivery business because they also have Elema, uh, right? So just want to understand a bit more on, on the grocery side. Yeah, so uh, okay, that one question that I saw you asked me is regarding the margins. Uh. So you can see that uh, recently in the past few quarters and the past one year, Alibaba, the margins dropped a lot. It's because of these new segments or when they go into the groceries delivery. So they acquired the Sun Art. Sun Art is actually a physical retailer. La. So think about it like in, in Singapore terms, it's like Sing Song Supermarket. They buy the whole Sing Song Supermarket of the China, a few thousand of us store. So a lot of these stores, they are converted into fresh shippo, which is Sing Sen Herma. So it is a super supermarket, but they also have the like, seafood segment, vegetable segment, and they will do delivery of this seafood, vegetable, and rice. Also, it's called fresh shippo. Why Alibaba is doing all this uh, uh, groceries deliveries? So we have to study the history of it. Before the tech crackdowns, uh, before two years ago, right? there's actually two camps. One camp is uh, Alibaba and the other camp is Tencent. So Tencent under their wing, right? they got uh, JD, Ping Toto and Meituan because they are under the same camp. Think about it like wrestling. One group versus another group, they fight it out. They will not ting uh, sui, fan he sui. They will not fight each other business. JD focus on they are the JD website, or uh, which the online e-commerce platform. Then Ping Toto focus on community buying, and Meituan they focus on the food delivery and groceries delivery. They don't enter each other space because they are under the same camp. But because of the tech crackdown, right, all these monopolies and duopolies, all the barriers destroyed already. So now uh, each of these companies they become independent and they fight against each other in this market. So for example, let's take JD for example. JD right now they have the Tata. Tata is actually a groceries delivery. Then for uh, Alibaba is the fresh Ipola, Sing Sien Herma, which then also the, so Tata is to fight against the Meituan, which is the groceries delivery. Then Meituan also got the Erle Mei, uh, Erle Mei is the Alibaba. They have a 30% market share for the food delivery business. Then Meituan, why Mai? They have 70% uh, market share in the food delivery. Then for the Xing, Xing Xi, uh, it's actually for the community buying. So JD now uh, see Ping Toto not as a brother already, become enemy already. So they fight in the community buying through the Xing Xi. Then Alibaba also go into the community buying space uh, with their Tao Chai Chai and Tao Bao Te Jia, uh, which is the Tao Bao special. Now, instead of uh, two teams uh, fight each other, right, it becomes like, uh, like wrestling. Uh, I say, right, it's become Royal Rumble. Everyone is thrown inside the wrestling ring and they have to fight against everyone else. It's survival of the fittest. So why they, everyone is entering all the different segments? Why don't they just stick to their own segment? It's because of the economies of scale. Like example, I'm JD. I already have a delivery fee that I used to deliver my laptop, deliver my fridge. So I might as well use the same fleet. I deliver vegetable, I deliver rice. Also, everyone entered the, the, all the different markets at the same time. So in the past, each market only has two or three players. Uh, in the past, only one or two players. But now each, each different segment has four players or so. So Alibaba, right, they want to uh, attack all the different segments also. That's why they have the Tao Chai Chai, chai and Xin Xian Herma. So because they enter this market, right, it's loss-making one. The early two to three years, will be loss making. That's why Alibaba, the core earnings are, is being dragged down by all these new units that are very heavy and loss making. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did notice that as well. For example, like TT, uh, we thought that TT is the largest one, but actually if you look at all the uh all these business, I think the list of competitors is I think more than 10. There's long list. Every segment, there's a lot of all, all these competitions. Yeah. But come back to the margin, right? I just want to like quickly uh us like when i look at the result let me share the screen so um this is the margin numbers that we, I, i'm looking at right so the first one is the gross margin and then the operating margin and the net margin the net margin uh, of course there's a lot of all these investment result stuff in there so that one uh, is very not very noisy and a lot of noise uh 
in there. But if we just look at the gross margin, operating margin is still going down and going down, right? So yesterday I was just debating with Chicken, like what's the number of the operating margin? Uh, but I look at the result is about 10% ish and used to be a lot higher in the past, right? So so my question to you is that what was your um expectation moving forward? Uh, do you think that this one, uh, the low margin, right, is kind of like uh, one off thing that um they, they were slowly picking up or is it like, like this is the new normal, like we will stick with this like 10-ish percent yeah. for many, many years. What was your expectations on that? Yeah, so to understand the gross margin now, we must look at uh, Alibaba, the business as a whole. So like for now, right, their core business is actually the China market. So it remains as a cash count. The margins are actually still the same. But what is dragging down the margin uh, is actually the logistic business, which is the Cai Niao. So it's been loss making over the past few years because they need to invest a lot or to grow and also the Ali Club also. So it's only recently then they turn profitable. That's why in the past, right, you see the margins keep declining. It's because of the logistic unit and the club unit and the entertainment unit. All this loss making keep dragging down the core earnings. But like, based on my own calculation, uh, if we strip out all the loss making units, we look at the core recurring income, right? They're actually making about $2 earnings per share per quarter. So every year they're making about $8 uh, in earnings just from the core business itself. Also, you strip away all the one-time investment losses and gains. The core earnings is about $8. So if you look at free cash flow, it should be similar because a lot of their earnings is actually in cash. So they are making about $5 billion of free cash of cash per quarter, about $20 billion per year. So that's about $7 to $7.50 of cash income per share per year. Uh, so free cash flow is about $7 per share. Earnings is about $8 per share per year uh, based on removing all the loss making unit. Uh, I think you want to pass this to Chicken. I think Chicken have a questions on competition that want to ask you, right? Ch- chicken? Yeah, sure. Right. So... I mean, I'm also Alibaba shareholder, so uh, I, I have my own answer, but I just wanted to ask ML on this topic where I've been reading quite a lot of analyst reports, um, basically from Goldman, uh, JP, etc., etc. They were saying that this entire idea of TikToking, like this, this they, they coined this term TikTokization. I don't know whether you heard of this term before. So everybody yeah. is, every Tom, Dick and Harry company is trying to get into live streaming, trying to get into those kind of live commerce. And I think based on an undisclosed report, TikTok actually, the advertising revenue, um, recently just surpassed Alibaba in 2022. So I, I don't know what's your perspective. I just wanted to get from your understanding as an Alibaba shareholder. Like, do you think it's uh, fat, which is after a while, everybody will revert back? Or do you think this is a long, longer term trend where everybody's trying to chase the next live streaming platform? Yeah, so TikTok, right, or Douyin, all this, right? So, like, for the average users, now they, like, in China, lah, on average, they spend about two hours every day to swa Douyin, to see the short form video and see the live streaming. So, it's a change of the consumer habit. So, they will capture a market share also because they will support their live, their influencers by buying products from them. So, if they are doing short form video, they might put up some links to sell some products. They will buy the product from the influencer or the influencer will do live streaming and they will say, oh, I, I sell you some products as related. Example, I'm a gaming channel. I will sell you mouse, laptop or, or the mouse pad and you will buy because you support me right? and you're so into gaming. So they will capture a, a market share from the live streaming and going into e-commerce. So the way I think about it, right, is the kick of the e-commerce is very big. Like for China, right, 50% of the purchase is done online. Also, another half is done offline, like shopping malls and in the supermarket. But this cake will become bigger and bigger over the next 10 years, from 50% to 60, 70, 80. So 10 years later, 80% of the purchase will be online. Then 20% is still in the physical malls because some things you have to do it physically, like buying a shoe, you need to test the shoe size, all this. So the e-commerce cake is getting bigger. The question is, Will TikTok uh, Douyin eat the whole cake? My answer is no. At most, they can only take that like, 20% of the entire cake. If you just think about it from a consumer point of view, let's say every month uh, you spend $1,000. Will you spend your entire $1,000 to support your 
influencer. You buy everything from your influencer. You buy your toilet paper, you buy your clothes, you buy your underwear, you buy your rice, you buy your instant noodle, all from the influencer, their, their online shop. Probably not, right? So for your $1,000 spending, maybe 20%, you go to the physical shopping mall to buy your shoe or buy your, your towel or what. Then another percentage, you will go to Lazada or Shopee to buy your rice, buy your instant noodle, buy your mineral water, your basic necessities, especially like hey, detergent, all this is very heavy, very bulky. So you, you want to buy online and it's delivered to you. So for a consumer, right, if your $1,000 spending, right, your $1,000 will be spent on different segments, or you know, physical shopping mall, online e-commerce platform, live streaming, or, or groceries delivery. So what Alibaba is trying to do, right, is they want to capture as much points as possible. Groceries, platform, online to offline through the fresh shippo, like, physical supermarket, online supermarket. But the only area they cannot capture is short form video. It's an area that Alibaba cannot penetrate. Uh, because quite so and towing is the dominant force. Uh, they are dual poly and it's very hard to penetrate. But the opposite is also uh, applies for the towing. By dance, they cannot enter into the payment market because it's dominated by Alipay and WeChat Pay. So all their purchase, right? Uh, Alipay and WePay, they will take a cut. Uh, because And they also, they don't have the resource uh, to get into the payment, to burn a lot of money to get into the payment. So in the past, Ali Pay and WeChat Pay, they do a lot of subsidy, burn a lot of money, then they capture this market share. Then for uh that like you see, uh, I do a share screen. Let's say for the e-commerce, uh, uh, you need to use logistics to deliver your goods. So we saw the China logistics, the revenue growth is 36%. Then we look at JD, the JD logistics is up 39%. So logistics is the area uh, where uh, ByteDance cannot enter because you cannot overnight build a logistic network to cover the entire China. You, to accomplish that, you probably need four to five years to have a physical network of logistics to cover the network. So for JD Logistics and China, more than 50% of their business come from external parties like Kuaiso, Pinduoduo, and uh, Douyin. So they will still give revenue to Alibaba and JD from the logistic business. Then uh, for ByteDance, it's also not feasible for them to get into the logistic business because there are already three different camps of players already in the logistic market. The three different camps, right? The first camp is the Cai Niao camp. Under the Cai Niao camp, there's like STO, ZTO, YTO, and Yunda. So together, they form an alliance to cover the entire China. Then the second camp is the JD Logistics. They also have the De Pan Kuai Di, Dipon. Then the third camp is a SF holding, Sun Feng. So these three different camps, they have three total, three physical logistic network covering the whole entire China. So it makes no sense for ByteDance to build a fourth logistic network to cover the entire network. So to summarize this, yes, the ByteDance will capture a big portion of the e-commerce cake, maybe 20%, 25%, 30%. But there are some areas that they are unable to penetrate, like logistics and payment. Yeah, that's all. Oh, logistic okay. competitions, right? I, I'm, I'm curious, like everyone's spending so much money to build their logistic uh, and use that as a mode, right? Would that lead to like over-investment and over-capacity and they, they become costly for everyone and hence uh, eating into their margins? W w do you see that happening or, or do you think that it's still under-invested? Um, yeah, so for logistic, right? Previously, uh, historically, it has always been under invest. So like you look at like the past few years of the Swang Si, right? Always when it comes to Swang Si, they get overloaded. The warehouse explodes. Then the delivery men, right? They stack out full with the parcel. They cannot send, send, finish. Or because uh, delivery in China is very cheap. In the US, you do one delivery, is 6 USD. But in China, it just cost 50 cents only. 50 cents Chinese yuan to deliver one parcel is the cheap because of the competitive between these three different camps. So all three camps are, all three of them, they are loss make, making. That's why JD Logistics, they public this. But now, like you see all the loss making businesses, right? They are all starting to become profitable. Like Meituan previously was loss making, but now in this quarter, they become profitable. But dance last year and, the, and before they were always loss making, but this year, ByteDance turn a profit. So all these businesses, they are starting to turn a profit because 
the competition has stabilized really. There's no new players. Now all the players is already established. All the different segments, there's always two to four different main players. And all of them, they no longer burn cash to capture market share. Now all of them is focused on cost efficiency. So example, like now the logistics player is me, you and chicken, three of us only. What for the three of us, we burn money to fight against each other to capture market share. All of us, we now we don't burn cash. We now focus see, on making profits. So the, the, the trend onwards for the next few years, right? You will see the net margin start to improve already because gone are the days of burning cash. And like I mentioned, JD, Meituan, Ping Duo Duo, Kuai So, all these, they have become independent really. They cannot raise money from Tencent anymore because Tencent is no longer their shareholder. Because like, they place out all the JD shares, they place out all the Meituan shares. The main shareholder is the stockholder, you yourself. Yeah. So they uh, then they can they either they borrow money from the bank, but they cannot raise money from equity anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to go back to the point on the competition part, right? I do agree that uh the pie is gonna continue growing bigger, but I think there's a certain level of saturation in the Chinese market now. So just to draw some numbers, right? Like from what I read and from what I understand. Uh, e-com market is still expected to grow, but I think it's going to slow down by a pretty significant extent, at least for the next four years. Because I think 2021, there was a huge growth spurt. So it needs to normalize downwards. So now I think the Kager for the following four years is around 3%. So assuming that Alibaba doesn't continue losing market share, technically, the top line should still grow by 3%. I mean, in line with how the market is going. I think my bigger worry now is like um, ML has suggested, if TikTok or ByteDance keep, or quite show keeps coming in to keep taking, they just keep coming down and take all the... I, I do understand that in the live streaming business, they tend to target the lower tier. So it's always the clothes, the cosmetics. All these are lower margin, but they go by volume. So my biggest worry now really is on how they're able to... Uh, uh, I, I, I can't seem to understand how they're going to fight off the competition from that side because it does seem like they have a very strong hold. Um, there is huge amount of, of, of interest, at least um, from ByteDance perspective as well. So on that part, I haven't squared away yet because um, I do agree, pie growing, yes. Um, they're not able to take everything, yes. Uh, but uh, from Alibaba's perspective, I don't really see how they're they are, they are at least trying to prevent this from happening. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I get what I mean. So for like the Chinese, right? The Chinese market, I mentioned the pie is growing, but Alibaba has this percentage of their core commerce business. So they cannot enter in the short-form video space. So they can only defend their market share. So going forward, I expect the Chinese core commerce business, right, the revenues to be flat. But to be flat is not a bad thing. It's still a cash cow generator. It will still generate the 5 billion in earnings, in cash every quarter. But where to find the growth? The growth will come from overseas market. Like we see the Xi'an now, is the fast fashion. It's growing very rapidly in the US market. Their annual growth rate is like 200%, 300%, insane. So uh, the TikTok, they also have that. Now they have the TikTok shop in the US. Then Ping Toto also enter into the US market to call Timu, T-E-M-U, or also to sell uh, the fashion stuff. So a lot of growth will come from overseas. Then Alibaba, they enter the US market is through AliExpress, Euro, European market is through Trendview, and Asian market, Latin America is through Lazada. So China there oh, is very hard for China, Alibaba to grow. They can only hold their position only. They must get the growth from the overseas uh, market. So people will ask, hey, Alibaba, how come the growth is so slow? Wow, I see the Shopee, their growth rate 50%, 100% in the past, but Lazada seems to be very slow growing. Also, because they don't understand the different uh, strategies, the different strategy between Lazada and Shopee. So for SE, right, in the past, they were, when they listed, is $20 only. Then they slowly, the price go up to 300 plus. So their strategy is as the stock price keep rising, right? Every year they will sell shares to raise uh, lots of billions of dollars. Then they will burn cash to capture market share. So in the past, right, or uh, in order to like see fifty percent, hundred percent growth rate in their Southeast Asia e-commerce market, they will burn almost two billion per quarter. Like here, you see one point one eight to ten point two, so the one point five two billion per quarter. So for SE, right, their strategy is burn money to capture market share. But for Lazada, right, because it's not a listed company, it's a, a unit under Alibaba, they start with an initial capital. Then with the initial capital, they have to grow organically. 
That's why Lazada, the growth rate is very low because they don't burn cash to capture market share. They just try to grow organically with whatever resource they have. That's why Lazada from the market leader, it be, become overtaken by the Shopee. Then now because of uh, uh, SE, right, they are now uh, Tencent started to sell the shares and they are, now they are a standalone unit and their stock price is very low. They cannot sell shares to raise capital and burn cash to capture market share. So for them, they have to be try to become like Alibaba, to become like Lazada, to become cash flow positive, to become profitable. That's why we see the cash burn. It went down from one billion per quarter and now just half a billion per quarter. So ideally, they want to have zero cash burn and the cash uh per quarter, cash holding per quarter can stabilize or even start to increase. So uh, to summarize it is uh, Alibaba in the China market, they are stagnant already. They are a mature cash count. Their growth must come from overseas market through Lazada. Their growth must come from logistics, payment, and the ID cloud. Yeah. Just now we talked a lot about the commerce and China logistics and so on, right? We, we haven't touched about the uh, cloud business because uh, the chart is, that I'm sharing here is showing the, the operating income of the cloud business. In terms of their growth, I think they are growing quite well. But when it comes to operating uh, income, I think this, they show one quarter of positive, then uh, subsequently these two quarters already back to negative. So have you paid attention to the cloud business? How's, what's their competitions with the rest, for example, Huawei, Tencent, and even other some SOE uh, um, institutions, right? They also have some cloud business ongoing. H- have you paid attention to this? So Eric? for cloud, right, in the China market, the top four player, number one is Alibaba, number two is uh, Tencent, number three is Huawei, and number four is Baidu. So for all of them, right, all their cloud growth, uh, you see it's just single digit or even flat. This is because of why? Because of the US regulation. In the past, right, a lot of their, the cloud, or let's say about, 60, 70% of the revenues come from the internet companies, those Chinese tech companies. But because of the crackdown, we saw the private education being destroyed already. Then for like example, for like ByteDance, their TikTok, uh, their cloud usually in the past, they use the Ali cloud. But because of the US regulations, they drop Ali cloud and they move over to Oracle. So for Alibaba, half of their internet tech companies, the cloud customers are, uh, they drop Ali Cup in the international segment and they move to the US competitor. That's why you see Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, their cloud still growing strongly because all these Chinese tech companies, they are forced to use the US cloud. They cannot use Ali Cup and Tencent Cup. That's why uh, by right, uh, the cloud the revenue growth should be negative one huh? because they lose so many customers due to the US regulation and the tech crackdown. But why end up the cloud uh, become positive? 4% is actually from the traditional industries they digitalize. So in the past, traditional industries they only form 30% of the crop revenue. Now the traditional businesses, they form about 50% of the crop revenue. Then going forward, it will be the reverse. 70% of the crop revenue will come from traditional business and only a small portion will come from the Chinese tech companies. Both Chinese internet companies, right? In the end, they don't, they are the competitor of Alibaba. Ma. So if I'm Tencent, cannot be I use Alika. I'm, I'm JD, I am Meituan, I am Pingtoto. Why I use Alika? I let you steal all my data. So the, their rivals, they will use their own cloud. Then uh, Alibaba can only target those traditional non-tech industries. Yeah, that's why now it's a shift of gear. They are shifting the gear. Though. So temporary, the cloud will be slow. But going forward, over the next five years, we could see the cloud go through go back to 20 to 30 percent growth rate also when the economy is better yeah because I, I believe that the governments will have all these requirement to say the data, yeah, at least data in China has to be kept within China. Yeah. So there must be some sort of, uh, you know, all these uh, restriction to force uh, these companies, even let's say Tencent, uh, I mean, at least for the data that they generated inside China, they, have, they cannot move out, right? So it cannot go to Amazon, AWS or Azure. So it has to say inside, it's either... Uh, just see where they flow to. Either they flow to some, some you know, Huawei, Alibaba. It, it has to be one of these local uh, cloud players, right? Yeah, so the China law is, uh, the China data can only, can only be stored in China. What's actually the data in the end, where's the data stored? It's actually stored in the data center. Then in the data center, there's a, a lot of personal computer, but without the monitor, uh, just the body only. Then inside have all the high-end chips, uh, 
to processor chips to process all this data and store all it. So all the physical servers are in China. That's why they spend a lot of money to build all this infrastructure. Then the US don't allow uh, the this like example, don't allow TikTok to store their data in China server in physically in China. So they can only use like Amazon Web Service or Google Cloud because Amazon and Google, their server is in US. Uh, so now the physical location of the cloud server matters a lot. Yeah. Mm. Chicken, do you have any other questions related to Alibaba? If not, I will switch gear to the other two topics. No, I'm great. There's a question in the in the yeah, in the chat though. Yeah. Yeah, yes, there, are, there are many Alibaba questions. Uh, yeah. We will, we will come back to that. Slowly answer. Yeah, slowly, yeah. Too, too many of them. We cover this one first because this one I, I think is, is quite, uh, um, I really want to yeah, ask. Very, yeah, yeah, very because, concerning. Yeah, very concerning because uh, I just run through a couple of headlines, right? So I think for um, COVID policy, I think just a few weeks ago, right, there's this rumor that talked about um, reopening and then the share price went up. Then... Uh, then I think they make some changes. They said they're going to uh, ease the this quarantine restrictions, right? So I think stock market also reacted positively. And then recently we, we see that there's all these um protests uh for uh, at the Foxconn factory, and then people want to go back to hometown, cannot go back. So and then recently we saw that there's a lot of protests uh ongoing in Guangzhou, and then lockdown also in Beijing. So. Actually, I think my, my sense, right, I didn't pay a lot of attention to what's happening in China, but just a surface level sense is that there are still all these uh, lockdown or semi-lockdown that's still happening uh, in the country. And the dynamic, the zero COVID policies, right, is still uh, in place. So at the same time, it seems that there's some sign of reopening. So so I just want to hear your thoughts on actually what, what's, what's the, how should we look into this, like, What's the expectation moving into 2023 and, and onwards? Are they going to, to reopen or not? And is this policy is going to stick forever? So, so this is my question. Sir. Yeah. So we start from the basic. Why China needs to do zero COVID? Because of their demographics. They have a lot of old folks and they don't want to do vaccination. The vaccination rate is just like 50% for those that are above 60 years old. So if they open up, a lot of these old people will die. That's why the past three years, they do the zero COVID. Because if a lot of old people die, then Xi Jinping worry that he will not be re-elected because there will be a lot of protests. So he have to wait for the re-election. So a few months ago, we saw the re-election and Xi Jinping now turned away already. So he become the third term, also ruler of China. So now what that he has the full power already, he can start to open up. So there was rumors that he will abolish uh, zero COVID once he's in power. So his strategy is actually not immediately open up in phase. So we can think of it as the, now recently we saw the 20 pointers. We can think of it as the phase one of the opening. But now the phase one is very messy. Like in Beijing, right? It's supposed to be the most strict, the city of the COVID measures. But their cases is rising rapidly and it's overwhelmed already. The hospitals are overwhelmed. So they are currently building extra capacity, more hospitals, more quarantine facilities, but it will take a few weeks to a few months for these facilities to be ready. So in the meanwhile, right, once the hospital capacity cross 100% overwhelm already, right, they will do a lockdown to bring down the cases so that the hospital can cope up with the outstanding cases. Then already a lot of elderly start to die already due to the infection. So it's now a very messy situation. And the common folks, they are very frustrated or they kind of locked down for three years already. They're going crazy already. That's why you will see riots and you will see protests. Then the Western media locked down, they will whack China. Then now open up, got protests, they will also whack China and make a lot of negative news. Because that's how they create traffic and create the views. Yeah. I think the protest is more on protesting uh, this di- um, zero COVID policy, right? Because yeah. I, I believe that I don't know how many of them are. Say, for example, they're reopening similar to Singapore situation also when, when reopenings, the hospital utilization also increased and then there also some sort of measures to cool it down, to, to press it a little bit, then slowly reopen. So we will go through this as uh, people gradually affected by COVID and then you get the immunity, then, uh, I mean, go back to normal as if like our current situations. I think China haven't go through that phase yet. So they are still, still um, you know, keep the cases quite low relative to their number of populations, right? But uh, I, my question is, 
because I look at the death rate, let's say for US per 1 million populations, right? It's about like, I think 3,000 per 1 million populations. Yeah. So if you just take the same ratio, you, you, you multiply by China population, I uh, think you, you should expect a couple millions of death yeah. if they so the, release a reopening. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you think so this, the, is, this makes sense to reopen? Yeah, so the analyst expectation is uh, if China reopen, right, the death will be at least at least uh, 2 million death. So that, that's like half the population of Singapore wipe out. Uh. <laughs> so 2 million, for Singapore population, I think 5, 5 million or what. So that's a lot. Uh. 2 million people will die due to this reopening. But they have no choice because it's out of control already. They cannot lock down for 10 years, 20 years. The people will go crazy. So now they are actually forced to reopen. But it will be in phases. So, so the analyst expectation, uh, because I'm not a COVID expert, uh, so I also refer to the experts. So experts believe that uh, the coming three to six months will be quite messy. Then to for China to achieve a stage like Singapore now, you can move freely without masks, right? Probably in the second half of 2023. So market has already priced in this expectation. But if by mid of 2023 still haven't fully reopened, right? Then the market might get worried because it's delayed until 2024. So there's a risk of this China risk due to the COVID also. Yeah, but why those uh, officials, right? They once every few days or once every one or two weeks, they will come out and say, we stick with the zero COVID. We stick with the zero COVID. So they keep <laughs> on like telling us like, okay, yeah. don't, don't expect reopening. Is there some sort of disagreement even among so, the yeah. officials? So it's for China, it's the culture problem because they are means The government, the CCP will never say sorry. The CCP will never admit they are wrong. So Paul... Policy wise, right, they're already wrong already. They, they should not have gone for three years of zero COVID. They should be like Singapore. The first one year, zero COVID, because you're still not familiar with the virus. You, you're afraid that it's very deadly. Then the second year, we understand that actually it, we can manage the virus through vaccination and that the death rate is not as high as what we expect. So that's why Singapore second year, we open up already. So in the second year or third year, they should have opened up already. So they make a mistake already, but they don't want to admit the mistake. So they say, okay, Tang we cannot give up. We must still fight the virus. We must still zero COVID. So their mouth is say zero COVID, but policy-wise, they have already started to open up. Their action and their words is totally not, not, not similar. It's not aligned. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually don't think that this is like right or wrong. I, I'm thinking that uh, you have to make a choice, right? Say, for example, you say I do zero COVID, then we press the number of death. In, in fact, if you look at China, number of death from COVID, I think it's very, very low relative to their population because of zero COVID, right? Then on the other hand is that if you reopen, then good for economy, then you need to accept that uh, even that, no, uh, doesn't matter how good is your vaccines, there will be millions, at least 1 million or 2 million people will die because of COVID, similar to US or, or Western or in, in other countries, right? They have to go through this. This is the cost to pay in order to reopen. And then, uh, but at least majority of the people who, who will survive this COVID, they, will, they can live normally after that. So it's a matter of choice, right? But yeah. right now, I, I don't know like, like I'm skeptical whether they, they will reopen because they might not willing to pay that, that cost, right? That few millions of that. Let's say if you are you are sitting here, are you willing to pay? Let's say, okay, this couple of millions of people are you guys go go, you guys they uh, die, not a problem. We have to reopen. Do you think that they they are going to so go that? In long? the end, it's like playing a game like that, you balance off one side is the economy, one side is the health of your so it's like playing a game, open a bit, open too much, open a bit, open too much. So it will keep swinging up and down. Lor. They will adjust their policy every quarter. But like now, they don't dare to fully open. They just open a bit only. Then the cases go haywire already. The COVID cases. Wow. So they are also very scared. So on and off, definitely over the next three to six months, we will see uh, lockdowns here and there to control the cases. A full reopening, half year or one year. Yeah. That's the, the ideal situation. Lah. I see. But then the government, right? Let's say you are a local, because they are managed state by state. Mm. So different government, right? They, they manage the population is different. Like Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen is very densely populated, like Singapore. Mm. So the spread can be very fast. So they have to, they, they will see more lockdowns. Whereas yeah. like those tier two, tier three company, uh, tier two, tier three city, right? Is more the population is spread more wider. So that one can freely open up. The COVID won't spread so fast. It's more like Indonesia, Thailand, those kind of, or Philippines like that. So they can just open up. So 
my belief is that different cities are the opening mm. will be different. The the lower tier cities they will be fully open first. Then the Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen ah, like we saw the I- iPhone factory uh, yeah. of protest all this yeah, because it's it's very crowded. Then it's like dormitories. Then they don't want to mix with people that are infected. There is very crowdly packed. Then the living condition and the food is very poor. That's why they have riots. So different cities will react differently to the COVID outbreak. Yeah. Yeah, they have to be nimble. La. So about the Foxconn uh, library, all these things, have you paid uh, attention to that? What, what was what's yeah, the situation? So, so the Foxconn, <laughs> right, they, let's say previously, they do the manufacturing of the uh, iPhone. La. So they need a lot of workers to do the assembly of the parts to build the iPhone. So all these workers, they come from the village. From all across China, they hire 100,000 different workers. So they travel from afar to come to Foxconn. Then Foxconn previously, they promised them that if they finish the contract, they will give them a bonus. But because of uh, they need to rush to deliver more output, right? Then they change the contract terms. They tell them that after Chinese, you have to stay after Chinese New Year, then uh, March, the mid of March, then walk past the mid of March, then I'll give you the bonus. Because a lot of workers, right? They feel that the living condition is very bad. The food is very bad. And the quarantine facility is also very uncomfortable. So a lot of them, they started to resign and leave. When they resign and leave, the Foxconn don't want to pay them the bonus. They say, if you leave now, because the conditions are bad, I don't give you bonus. You must stay until after March. So they are very unhappy. That's why I staged a riot. So now Foxconn, in order to resolve this thing, at the end of the day, it's all about money. The workers just want money. So they pay them. You Now you resign, I give you 8,000 yuan. Then you bought the bus, I give you another 2,000 yuan. You just go. Don't give me trouble. So a lot of these new workers, they took the money and they leave already. So the problem is resolved. But no, fundamentally, uh, I don't blame Foxconn for, for this. Actually, the problem uh, is Apple should give more support. You see Foxconn has uh, so much trouble, but Apple, you look at the results. Revenue still growing. Net profit still growing. Because Foxconn, they are just a middleman. They are a supplier. So when they take the Apple contract, right, their margins are super thin eh, to do the assembly. So, but because of COVID, they have a lot of added costs. They must do COVID tests. They must provide dormitory. They must provide food. They must provide medical. So from profit making, right, they become loss making. So in order to save the cost, right, of course, they give the workers the cheapest food, the cheapest living condition. So Apple by right should subsidize this, but Apple is not doing it. That's why uh, Apple should give more help. So maybe after this, they will review and then Apple will give some help. So Apple shareholder might be affected because of this. Uh, Foxconn incident, yeah, yeah. I think uh, definitely. Uh, usually, throughout the supply chain, there will be uh, segments that is high profit margin, which is uh, Apple is capturing that. But the low yeah. profit margin, all these go to a- Asian countries, uh, and, and Foxconn yeah. is the one. Their their business model is basically using scale to to play the scale, right? Very thin margin, but large scale. But now, uh, once every you know, so, so there there will this kind of problem popping up uh, from time to time. Yeah. Chicken, you have any questions want to ask on, on COVID? If not, we move towards more macro topics on, on real estate. Uh, as in, I think for COVID, I have nothing much to comment because, I, I mean, it's a short-term versus long-term problem, right? I don't care whether they open up in one quarter or eight quarters later. They're still going to open up. Um, I'm not punting for when they're going to open up or how is it going to affect because all these are very... you. After you, you can debate for another two hours. It doesn't. It doesn't. This doesn't go anywhere. The discussion. So that's why I I don't really put too much focus on that. And um, I guess for a lot of investors, they are kind of disappointed because everybody was saying that oh um there are signs, there are signs, but still haven't opened up. But I think the more concerning part for me when I scroll through my Twitter timeline was there was a huge ton of protests from many different places. Some people in universities, some people go to the roadside. And then um, I think there was this fire that happened in one of the buildings at Xinjiang. And then they went to the same road name of that place to go and protest. I was just thinking, I mean, it's a good, this this kind of protest is a good thing. Um, it's, it's a good and bad thing. So the good thing is, hey, at least they get to protest. I'm not another country that is illegal. I'm not going to name the country. But I think it's a way of check and balance to the government saying that, hey, um, there is this, there is this Ming Yuan. So people are unhappy about certain things. So you guys better take into account this feedback. So this is the first part. So in terms of check and balance, I think it's functioning very well. But I think on the second part is 
Um, it's probably not going to change. It's a lot more form than substance. So it means that it's not going to change anything. China is not going to open up today just because of your protests. So on one hand, I think I'm happy for something like that to happen. I'm not happy as in for people that, that got injured in the meantime or people that die. But I mean happy in terms of the check and balance working. But I'm happy because um, it's not going to change anything. And if they need to bring in the tanks, they're going to bring in the tanks if there's too much chaos. So they have to draw the, um, in a way, they have to draw their own line saying that let's not take it too far. We express our, our opinions, we express our discomfort, and then let's get, let, let continue life, life goes on. So I think that's just my perspective on that. Mm. Yep. Th- thanks uh, for the comment. I, and speaking uh, on the discomfort, I think this uh, property crisis, I think is even more discomfort. And this, this one affect like majority of the people. So it's, it's not just like uh, like certain places, right? So uh, similarly, I'll run through a couple of headlines. So I think this one is not new. It has been ongoing for some time already. So uh, in fact, it started around like end of December, 2021 uh, uh, with this Evergrande situations. I think we, we also spoke about this uh, quite quite a few times. And then we, we saw that this one actually spill over to the economy and we 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 see that even their GDP numbers also affect us, right? I, I would I would say these GDP numbers become lower as what um Maslin just just mentioned. I think it's not all everything about the COVID. It's also about the real estate as well and all the uh lockdown situations. Uh. Then um I, I, this one I think is also quite famous. Around September, there's a uh, China uh, mortgage boycott where people just say, okay, um if property prices is, is get like get keep on dropping why not i just like stop paying and if this one become more serious i think even the bank banking sector will be affected as well then uh lastly which is the latest one which i haven't looked into a lot of details i want to listen uh what was uh comments from master leong is that you know now i think the banks are asked to provide um capital uh to the property sectors and this one the headline is saying that uh more than 600 billion yuan to 10 property developers. So I, I think this one is more like, you know, a government just tap on the their banks and ask the banks to support the property sectors. So so I, I just want to like pause here and and ask uh Master Young, like, like have you what's your take on this entire property things? Uh are, are, are CCP trying to cool the uh, property sectors and then after it crashed so much that they have to stack back in and save the, the market yeah. again? What are they trying to do here? I, I'm a bit confused. Yeah. So first of all, I must understand property market, the history, how the bubble is formed. The bubble is formed because over the past decade, China had a very high GDP growth, 7%, 6%. So a lot of people, they become the middle class and they are very wealthy. Then Chinese, if you get married, you need to buy a house. Then they also buy a house for investment because Chinese they feel that physical asset is the real investment. Stocks are is not, not investment because that's paper asset. So Chinese they like to hold house as an investment. So there's very strong demand for property. And they went on a building spree. And many of these property developers they were five times and even 10 times leverage. So you know, so it's like driving a car. The car is over speeding already. 200 kilometers per hour. So Xi Jinping, right, the CCP, they slam the brakes. They break so that the property uh, sector can slow down, don't overexpand. They introduce the three red line. So the three red line basically is looking at your gearing ratio. If your debt is too much relative to your equity or your assets, then you cannot borrow any money. Then the bubble, they try to pop it in 2020. Then just nice after they announced the three red line, COVID came. So when COVID came, right, the businesses, they lose confidence. They don't want to spend money. Then consumers tighten their, their wallets. Then for the developers, right? First, uh, the consumers tighten their wallets. They don't want to buy the house. They just want to buy their basic needs. What, now, recession already, so-called economy slow down recession. Why I still want to go and buy a house? So there's low demand for a purchase of house. So the property developers, they cannot sell the house. So their cash flow is affected. So cash flow is like blood to the developer. They cannot, they have to hold on to the, project, right? So they don't have the cash injection, then they cannot continue the other project. So the other projects become uncompleted. So when the uh, projects become un- uncompleted, then the common folks, they are angry. Why am I making my monthly payment when you are not building anymore? So they start to boycott, they protest. I don't want to make my money payment unless you start building. So the CCP are like driving the car, right? They, they, instead of slowing down the car, right? They press the brake too hard. The whole car stop. The whole economic engine for the property comes to a halt. 
but developers, they cannot deliver the project. They cannot build anymore. And the customers, they are not paying the money mortgage. So the whole system freeze already. So now they need to restart the car. How to restart the car? Pump a lot of money. That, that, that's why. So to look at the property sector, right? Because of this hot in the property market, a lot of property developers, they went bankrupt. Evergrande, the biggest developer, they went bankrupt. So the CCP policy is they don't build out these companies. So comp companies that miss the bond payments, right? Their, their shares and their bonds, they are suspended. So equity holders, they are wiped out. You hold Evergrande shares, is toilet paper. It's not traded. You cannot trade it. Likely your value is zero. Then if you hold those property developers, their bond, right? Their status is now D. Like you see the rating triple A, triple B, triple C. D huh, is not donkey. It's default. Huh? <laughs> it means no, no value already. But huh, it can still be traded. If a rating D, right? It can still trade on the market, but it's like 20 cents, 30 cents like that only because they believe that the creditors did that after you sell away the whole company, there will be some residual value. Lah. So the whole property market for China now, right? They are, look at the bond prices. Lah. It's trading at 50 cents to the par value. That means half price. What does this mean? In layman terms, right? The market is interpreting that half the property developers have gone bankrupt. So at the bottom, right? The the bonds were trading at 50 cents to the dollar. But now he has rebound already due to all the money that the CCP has pumped inside. So in, in the case of that liquidation, right, shareholders is wiped out first, followed by the bondholders. Then lastly is the bank loan. So now what CCP is doing is that they get the six big banks, or like ICBC, CCB, ABC, or a Bank of China, BOC. So all these big banks together, they will lend money to these developers so that they can complete the projects. So they are pumping in about $1 trillion. Each of the banks, they contribute a bit to save all the different developers that are still surviving. So basically, the government is taking over the property project that is uncompleted. Then they pass it to other developers that are still healthy. Then the developers that are still healthy, right? they will borrow money from these state-owned banks and they will complete the project and then they will de deliver it to the common folks. So in the end, shareholders, bondholders, they are wiped out. And the common folks, they are saved by the CCP pumping money into the bank and the bank completing, lending money to the developers to complete these projects. So the outlook is once these projects, they are completed and delivered to the common folks, the common folks will make their mortgage payment. Because now I give you the house, to stay in the house, of course, you have to pay money. right? So they start paying the mortgages, the developers will start uh, receiving the money or then they can continue to build even more houses. Then the property price in China over the past 12 months have been declining. So every month, property prices drop 1%, 2%. So they did drop more than 10%. Eh? So analysts believe that uh, it will still continue to drop until the year end. Then next year, the property prices should start to stabilize. I don't believe the property prices will go up. Uh, it likely will go sideways uh, because of the supply. There's still a lot of supply in the market. But the property prices should stabilize next year. And then the engine will, will start to start again already. Or people will start to buy property. Once, once the COVID reopening open up, people will start to spend money. People will start to go to work. People will start to buy property. People will start to get married. So you get married, you must buy property. That's the Chinese culture. So the thing is, uh, the property segment uh, is very hard to invest in because shareholders, bondholders, they are wiped out. So people who want to invest in the property market, they will consider investing in the China banks. Because China banks now, the PE ratio is low, the price to book is low, the dividend yield is high. But banks is a safer choice because they, when they lend money, right, through a bank loan, right, and when the property is sold, right, the money first goes to the bank as the first line of repayment. After they repay the banks first, then they repay the bondholders. The shareholder is the last person to get money because they hold equity. They don't get dividend. They are the last person. So the last person likely won't get money already. Then the bondholders, the market is pricing that they will get 20 to 30 cents on the dollar only. But the banks, right, despite they are pumping trillions of dollars, right, they will get back their money. Oh, so that's the thinking. Uh. If banks, they don't get back their money, right, and there's another round of default, uh, then that is called systemic risk. Then the whole China will crash already. But I don't believe that will happen. Uh. <laughs> but do, do you think that... Uh... Like this intervention that they are trying to do, basically they started out to say we have to cool down the markets. And now you say, okay, the, the prices has uh, coming down a bit uh, and hopefully um, it will continue to come down or stabilize, right? But 
we know that in a functioning market, after this adjustment phase, um, I think the 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 house prices will still go up, right? Because if it keep on going down, also I don't think it's healthy because nobody will want to buy house because let's say if every year you wait, you you get two percent discount, you will just wait, right? So so why would you buy? So so it will not. It's very hard to keep at a stable level. It's either uh healthily go up or or it crashing down, right? So so do you think that this intervention by the government do, do you see that as a success or or do you think that they are doing all sorts of things mess things up and create all this trouble for no reason and uh, ultimately the 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 house price will still continue to go up in the future right yeah so like this year right the way ccp they do the firefighting uh, is actually not so effective like they every quarter they launch a new measure then next then it doesn't work then they, another quarter then they launch another new measure so it's like firefighting they pour a bit of water, the, the fire don't, don't extinguish, then they pour more water. What they should have done is uh, one year ago or earlier this year, they have been more aggressive, really do a super QE, one shot, clean the fire. But they but now they realize their mistake, that the fire is still there. That's why in the recent quarter, they really pump the money, it's really a lot. They lower interest rate and they really pump in trillions of dollars already. If like that also cannot extinguish the fire, uh, means a gone case already. By right, should, should solve the problem. Uh. That's why the market now already, the bond market uh, has already bottomed off already. So the bond market is considered the smart money. Now the bond market is more efficient than the stock market. Because the stock market, there is retail investors that are trade very emotionally. The bond market is all institutional investors, which is the banks that invest in this property developer, the bonds. So the banks, they have their credit analysts, do all the homework, crunch all the numbers. So basically, the smart money has already priced in that the property market has already bottomed and that it should recover from here. But whether the property price will go sideways or go up, it, property market is based on one thing only, supply and demand. The problem is supply will be low because a lot of property developers, they went bankrupt already. So there will be less builders. So only a few. So, so if the supply is low and the demand is strong, then the price will go up. But demand strong or not depends on that the reopening, whether the COVID will be removed or not, whether the economy will resume or not. So the COVID uh, affects a lot of things. It affects the economy, it affects the consumer spending, it affects the property market. So that's why all eyes is whether China will open or not. That's why when China say, well, the 20 pointers, right? Wow, the, the fund managers, they get excited. They buy, buy, buy. And the stock market and the bond market rally. But in the end, fundamentally, will it happen or not? I don't know. We shall see how it plays out. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. I think uh, a lot of things, uh, all these macro things, they're all kind of related, uh, one link yeah. to another. So sometimes not so easy to, to uh, project forward also. So I, I was just uh, pause here and see, Chicken, if you have any questions um, you can ask. If not, we right. go to the... Um, sorry, sorry, Bundi and Master Leong. Sorry to Yes, yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure if you guys have already explained earlier, um, but you know, these uh, massive loans that the Chinese banks are going to give to these uh, developers, right? Property developers. Um, it, there will, these loans come with some, some interest, right? Very, although very marginal, there yeah. will be some interest. Yeah, the interest, for now, actually, China, the interest rate is much lower than US. US, the risk free rate, like 4%. But China, actually, they lower their interest rate. All the central banks raising interest rate, but China keep lowering their interest mm. rate. So it's now the, the loans that they are charging to the property developers just 2 to 3%, very cheap. Also recently, China this year, they reduced their triple R, the reserve ratio, twice already. Recently, they reduced an, another time by 25 basis points. So by reducing the reserve ratio, the banks, they need to park less money with the central banks. So the banks have more money to lend out, which they can lend out to the developers. And because there's more supply of this money, the interest rate is much lower. Then in China environment, 2 to 3% interest rate is almost lending free money because the inflation in China is 3%. So by lending at 2 to 3%, you are basically lending money at zero like that. Mm -hmm. So it's free money to the developers. So mm -hmm. the concern is uh, the developers will take the money, will they be able to complete the project and sell out, sell to the common folks or not? If they complete the projects, but the common folks still don't buy the, the property, the property becomes uh useless then they have to write down the asset then the banks will take a hit then, like, like mm -hmm. in 2008 and 2015 and last time the asia financial crisis nobody buy the property and the banks the npr non-performing loan 
shoot up. Now their non-performing loan is about 2%. Then during crisis, uh, non-performing loan can jump up to 5%. That means a lot of that like 3% to 5% of their assets uh, is default already. The people, they don't pay the loan for the property. So what happened is uh, China, they created four asset management. One of them is called Hua Rong. Uh. So these asset management companies, they'll buy over the assets from these state-owned banks to clean up their balance sheet. So this time now, at the end of the day, right, there will be some tidy up. Right? The, 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 this, the China, the big four, big six bank, they will sell their distressed or lousy assets at a discount to these asset management companies like Hua Rong to tidy up their balance sheet. Yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, so am I right to say that um, the, the, so the risk is that after the developers develop the property, they can't sell it. Lah. So that would be the major risk. Lah. Not, yeah. they, they are not... Okay, okay. Understand. Okay, thanks, thanks. Yeah, welcome. Oh yeah, I think one, one thing a lot of people ask me is uh, my Ali position, Alibaba position how? So I update on my Alibaba position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so originally, right, for me, right, you all know lah, I all in Alibaba. So I my initial capital for my portfolio, I put 300000 into Alibaba and I went 1.5 times leverage. My average price is about 140 to 150 So originally when I went leverage, I believe that Alibaba will only fall 50% from peak. But then I'm wrong. Alibaba crashed 80% from peak and it went down to as low as $60. So in an unleveraged portfolio, by right, my losses should be 55%. But because of the 1.5 times leverage, right, my losses came in at 80%. So from a $300,000 portfolio, at the lows when Alibaba was $60, my portfolio went down to $60K. So I had a loss of $240,000. So the lesson here is don't play margin, don't use leverage, can die until very jalan. So at the peak, I have 14,000 shares of Alibaba in the Hong Kong market. But because the stock price dropped so low, I faced a margin call. So in order to prevent liquidation, I had to sell 5,000 of my Alibaba shares. So in March, I faced one-time margin call when the Alibaba dropped to $70. Then recently, it dropped to $60. I cannot margin call again. So now I only have 9,000 shares of Alibaba. So what does this mean? So when Alibaba start to go up, right, I have, I'm holding less shares. So my gain is less. So if I did not use any leverage, I'm still holding to 14,000 shares of Alibaba. Alibaba go back to 140, 150, I will break even and I get back my 300,000. But because of the forced selling, I have realized losses on my 5,000 shares on Alibaba. To make back on the losses, I need Alibaba to go even higher. So for now, right, I need Alibaba to go to 180 to $200, then I can get back my $300,000 portfolio value. So a lot of people ask me, Master, Will you still have conviction in Alibaba? My answer is yes. I will hold on to Alibaba. And my plan is that uh, like this year, I no more money already. I got money. I will have top up my account to prevent the margin call. But next year, every month, I will try to put $500 to $1,000 to continue to DCA into Alibaba. As long as the price is $150 or lower, I will still buy Alibaba because I believe the fair value is $200 and above. Yeah. So good luck and take care. Yeah, that's all. I want to ask, right? Because you, because I let's say look at this year. I, I don't think you have like a lot of cash flow to deploy into the stock market. Basically, the the three hundred thousand yeah. that you have is like like a, a bullet kind of money that you have, and you just yeah, whack all of them into yeah. into Alibaba. Actually, back then, right? Why why don't you uh you know that because of cash flow you you don't have all this like a lot of cash flow. Why don't you just like stagger in like like uh in tranches uh, like like kind of like a oh. DCA things? Why don't you do do that and, and instead choose to like just one off whack into yeah. Alibaba? So so my investing style is. A bit like Peter Lynch one. I, I copy Peter Lynch, I copy Charlie Munger. So as a value investor, right, we are always 100% vested. I don't hold cash because I believe cash is the returns is very low. So I'm always 100% vested. So before I went into Alibaba, my portfolio is actually DBS, Propnex, and uh, Thai Beverage in the Singapore market. So DBS, I sold away. Propnex, I sold away. Thai Beverage, I sold away. Then all the money I went to put into Alibaba, why I dare to all in Alibaba is because of two things. Alibaba is a reflection of the China economy and it's too big to fail. If Alibaba collapsed, I missed the whole China already collapsed already. So if I, I die on Alibaba, then everyone die with me also because they have the strongest balance sheet. Uh, then secondly, right, uh, in regards uh, to the Alibaba, right, uh, they have a track record. Uh, 
and they are a blue chip company, I didn't believe that they will drop more than 50%. Just like in Singapore market, you buy DBS, you don't think DBS will drop 80%. Uh? DBS drop 80%, people will jump already. But end up, I'm wrong. Uh. So my, my, my mistake is that I use leverage and I didn't believe that Alibaba will drop 80%. So in the end, it's a painful lesson. Uh. So I should not have used the leverage. Yeah. But but then my investing style is like that. Focus, fire, and all, all in into a company I believe is a good company and undervalued. Like Charlie Munger, right? He only has three companies. He's a billionaire, but his portfolio only three stock only. Costco, Berkshire Hathaway, and the Lidu Fund. So in the past, right? He's, when he's like 50 years old, right? 40 years old, he's all in by Costco. His whole portfolio, few hundred million, few million dollars, just one stock only, Costco. Or few million dollars, just one stock per share. So my style is follow them, but I'm not Charlie Munger. I'm Master Leong. Yeah, Master Leong, lose money. Charlie Munger, billionaire. So there are many lessons to be learned. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to ask, right? What was your. Like you deem Alibaba as undervalued, right? So what was your entry price as in? When do you enter the position? And was yeah, it 300,000 so, one time? So uh, uh, Alibaba, right? Uh, first of all, right? Uh, I, I monitor it for a few years already. Since IPO, I will see the stock already. I see IPO last time, what? $68 IPO, then went up to $90, then went up to $320, $310. After they filled the M financial IPO, right? It dropped to $240. Then I said, wow, dropped 20% from peak already. Wow, looks delicious. So I, my DBS and PropNet, I got profit. Man. So I DBS, I sold away, take my profit. Then I take the money to buy Alibaba at $240. Then Alibaba continue to drop. Then I sell my pop next. I buy Alibaba again. I think like 1501, 180. Then Alibaba drop again. Then I sell my time. So I keep buying. So I, I in stages, so I sell DBS, buy, sell pop next, buy, then uh, sell Thai beverage to buy. So from 240, right, I buy all the way down until $100. Then I no money already. Then my average price is 140 to 150. Then I'm also 1.5 times leverage. So I keep buying all the way down. But if now huh, I still got any Singapore shares, I got any bank or risk, huh, I confirm sure sell away and buy more Alibaba at this price, be it $70 or $80. So it's because I, I, my whole life, uh, 14 years in the stock market, I never seen such a bullshit company selling so cheap. Uh, it, it's like in Singapore market, you see DBS from $30 drop to $10. $10 DBS, how can you not sell everything and buy DBS? So that, that's my thinking. Huh? Yeah. Thank, thanks a lot for all, you know, very transparent with all, your history on how, how you get into, into it. Yeah. Uh, 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 Master Leon, sorry, I, I just have a quick question. Uh, what was the current, the latest EPS for Alibaba? Oh, yeah. So, uh, oh, so the two questions I get most often, I can look at, I went through the slide already. So people, they ask me two questions, EPS and also the uh, cash per share, how I get the value. So let me do a share, share screen. Uh. Hey, I cannot share screen while participant. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Yeah, so you adjust. Yeah, so the earnings per share, right? You all see how it's very confusing. Yeah, you see the earnings per share, right? Wow, why is it minus $7 or wow, so much? Uh. They do so much money. It's because they have an investment portfolio. Uh, there are subsidiaries, they are public listed. Also, uh, when the US market crash, the China market crash, they have to do a one time write down. But these are just paper losses only. So what we want to look at uh, is look at the, this one, the adjusted earnings per share. So this is the $1.60 is from their normal business. Uh, so you should look at this number. So if you analyze it, uh, you might get $6 per share per, per year. Uh, because $1.50 you times four. So Alibaba earns $6 US dollar, uh, per year. But for the way I look at it, uh, the earnings per share is actually higher. Because inside this earnings per share, right, there are a lot of loss-making units. Like Alicloud is losing money, Chai now is losing money, then the Lazada losing money. So a lot of loss-making units. But if you remove all the loss-making, the earnings per share right, is about $2 per share. Then the annualize it, one year they make about $8 per share. So now if a stock price of $80, right, that's a PE ratio of 10 times. Then another question people often ask me is, wow, Master, you said Alibaba got $30 cash per share. But I look at the website, a lot of those websites, they tell you that the cash is only $10 per share because those websites, right, is automated one. They take the cash minus the debt, then they give you the $10 per share. It's, they automate it. But as an investor, you have to look into the annual report. Like this is the recent annual report or end, end of March 31st. So how I get the 
cash per share, right? I take this, the cash, short-term investment, this three cash item, uh, so you take 40 plus 30 plus 6. So total is about $76 billion. So in the online platform, right, those websites, right, they will take this $75 billion, $76 billion, they minus off their bank borrowing and the, their debt and their bonds that they issue. Then they get you the $10 cash per share. For me, right, I look at it from a business owner point of view. First of all, you see, Alibaba got so much cash. Why would they want to borrow money? Now, you look at the balance sheet. There's bank borrowing. They borrow from bank money. Also, here is 38 uh, billion RMB. Then they also have the uh, and it's the senior note, it's actually bonds. Uh, they issue bonds in the open market and they pay a 3 to 4% interest rate. Why Alibaba are so cash rich? They need to issue bond and take a uh, bank loan. Actually, they use all this loan is to purchase assets. So, for example, you buy a condominium, you buy a property, it cannot be you pay the property 100% cash down. You pay 20% cash down and 80% you borrow money from the bank. So, all these borrowings that Alibaba has is actually to purchase assets. So, what are the assets that Alibaba purchase. Alibaba the assets they purchase is actually stocks, bonds, and property. Stocks you can see, then eh? listed equities, 124 billion RMB. Then they also have a debt investment, they invest in bonds also. Then they also have property, like building and property. So we don't care the computer all this are computer all this we count as zero. Huh? So that what are these property? For example, in Singapore market, the Lazada the headquarters is at the AXA Tower. The AXA Tower is fully owned by Alibaba. They buy it for like 1.2 billion US dollar. So the way I look at it from a business owner, right? I take the asset, the property stocks and bonds, and minus off the bank loan. So the, the stocks and property, they will cancel off the bank loan. So I assume that this $76 billion is all my cash. Also, we get the $76 billion figure, then we compare it with Alibaba, the market cap. So Alibaba now, the stock price is $75 with a, market cap of 200 billion. So we take out a calculator, we take 76 billion in cash, okay, 76 billion in cash over 200 billion of market cap. So 38% of the market cap is in cash. We convert it to stock price. The stock price of $75, right? So we get $28.50 cash per share. That's why I say Alibaba has $30 cash per share as a round up. Lah. So to think of it as business term, let's say I'm a business owner, I own 100% of Alibaba. Now I can ask Alibaba to pay me out a $25 cash dividend. Alibaba pay me a $25 cash per share dividend, it can still operate. I just withdraw all the cash from the company and Alibaba can still operate normally. But why isn't Alibaba giving up us this $28.50 cash as dividend? Because they want to hold it as a cash war chest to do acquisition or to do share buyback. So recently, we see Alibaba, they do, they upsize their share buyback. From 25 billion, they upsize by 15 billion USD to 40 billion. So, so far they have utilized half of it already. So they're doing another 20 billion plus more of share, share buybacks. So current market cap is 200 billion. You buy 20 billion of shares, that's 10% of the outstanding shares. So if every year huh, Alibaba, what, Alibaba makes 20%, uh, 5 billion of cash per quarter and 20 billion of cash per year. If every year Alibaba use the 20, 20 billion cash to buy back its shares, uh, 10 years uh, later, I, I'm the only shareholder left already. I own 100% of the Alibaba. <laughs> yeah. Can so clarify, you. the 40 billion is like accumulative numbers or is it like a annual numbers? Yeah, so the 40 billion of share buyback is over... Uh, a certain years until the end of 2024, 2025. So mm -hmm. in the so they already bought 20 billion already. So the next 20 billion they will buy over the next eight to 10 quarters. So over the next two and a half year, they will buy the 20 billion, another 20 billion worth of Alibaba shares. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say take uh, that 20 billion spread over two years, right? That's about yeah. like one 10 billion per, yeah, per 10 year. Billion per, per year so 10 billion off. is still lower than uh the yeah, cash, uh, flow, cash flow for operations, yeah. right? They they have about like 20 billion kind of, uh, yeah. 20 billion, so, around 20 billion cash flow. Yeah, so so that's why the cash keep accumulating because they are generating too much cash. So if yeah, you are buying true. Alibaba, you are buying as a cash count. Well, the, the cash is too much. They do so much share, share buyback, they still have cash. My belief is that Alibaba high chance end of this work year, they could pay a dividend. Last year, JD paid a dividend $1.20. Then Tencent paid dividends by giving the 
JD shares and Meituan shares. So I think it's time for Alibaba to also pay a dividend, but they might not pay if they believe they can use the cash to make acquisition, like they purchase the Sun Art, or let's say they want to enter into a new area. They want to enter like semiconductor. They want to produce chips, then they might acquire a chip company and they might use a lot of billions of dollars. So I don't know what's the management plan. They want to do acquisition or they want to pay dividend. I also happy. Just use the cash. Don't don't keep holding the cash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally agree. Okay. Let, let's move to Slido. If not, we, we don't have enough time to to go through. I I saw this long list of questions. Uh, if, if there's any questions, if you have no comment, we will just skip ahead so that we, we give more time to other questions. Huh? So I'll, I'll read out the the questions. Some are not questions. Some are statement. So the first one. Uh from Anonymous is uh, don't need to listen to those <laughs> who want to poke at you from my experience those who poke inside they're quite miserable quite sad actually really quite sad so so I think this one is the kind of like you know, uh, words of encouragement to you la. so yeah, yeah. even though yeah. uh, investment return not so good but still yeah. you, you continue to share so, your yeah. so maybe I give yeah. some sharing la. like see I lose now, what's this market a lot of people lose a lot of money so everybody is very upset very angry so everybody is frustrated so I can understand why people will make negative comments to me like, ha ha ha, you lose 200,000 on Alibaba, you are so stupid. Oh, but everybody is stressed in the stock market, but you have to, money, right? For me, like I lose my money, I can earn back. To me, money is just a number. At the end of the day, when you leave the world, right? You cannot bring your portfolio with you to the, the heaven or to another world, right? Your portfolio will reset to zero when the day you pass away. Most important is your health. Some people, I got friends, they are age 30, uh, early 30s only, the hair all drop, the hair all turn white. Then they high blood sugar, high blood pressure or high cholesterol. Well, they are very stressed in the stock market. Then their health is affected. So at the end of the day, right, invest, you should invest accordingly to your risk appetite and how much volatility you can take. Don't let it affect your health. Like you see me, my hair is still there. My hair never turned white. Then I every year I do my health checkup, my blood sugar, my blood pressure, my cholesterol is all very okay. So don't worry about master. Master is still very healthy. But if the stock market is affecting your physical health or mental health, then you should review your portfolio. Are you taking on too much risk? Can you afford to lose the money or not? Yeah, so that's my sharing. Yeah, yeah. You you definitely look much younger than, than your actual age. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, next one. Um. Master Leung, do you think that US market is overvalued or the US market is much more forward-looking than the past? Are, are other markets, China or EU, too risky now? Yeah, so people, when they look at the market, right, some of the YouTubers, they will just show you one chart. They say, wow, US, you see the P ratio so high. P ratio is 20. Historical P ratio is 15. That's why they say US market is overvalued. It will crash further. But let's say that, that the way I look at business, right? You must look at it from a business point of view. If you only look at the numbers, right? You cannot find the true picture. The historical P ratio is 15 because historically the S&P over the S&P 500 over the 100 years is a lot of cyclical companies like automakers, property developer, banks, and also uh, so all these are cyclical companies that, and oil companies, energy companies, they make up a big portion of the index. But the past decade, uh, the index component changed already. 25% of the index uh, is made out of the FANG stocks, which is the big tech companies, which have... In big tech companies, uh, they are different from traditional companies. They are not cyclical. During recession, uh, people, you will still see that Apple, their earnings and revenues still holding up. Whereas property developers, their revenues drop a lot, their earnings drop a lot. So... The P ratio 20 now is different from the P ratio in the past. Oh, P ratio in the past is because they are those traditional business, their mode is not so strong. Now the P ratio 20 right, is actually reasonable. It's comparable to the past, the PE 15. Like PE 15 is fairly valued. Now S&P 500, PE 20, I would say is also fairly valued. The US market is not overvalued because the components have changed. It is very tech stock heavy. So to look at the S&P 500, you must look at the top 10 stocks. You ask yourself, is Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, all these com companies uh, overvalued? Facebook, PE 10. Google, PE 17 or what? Microsoft, PE 20. I don't think they are overvalued. I think they are fairly priced. Then some of them, like Facebook, is cheap. Lah. So some of them are fairly priced. Some of them are cheap. I don't think US market is overvalued. Then we look at other markets, like we look at China market, Hansen Index oh, recently at the lows, it traded at a 25-year low. 
the PE ratio is six times. The dividends is just four four percent. So historically, oh, when the Han Hansen index when it crashed right like global financial crisis of two zero one five, the dividend yield will be about five percent. But why now the dividend yield is only four percent? It's less, but the PE ratio is similar to the previous crash. It's because the components change also. In the past, the Hansen index is banks and properties form up the majority of the index. Now for the Hansen index, 30% is financial stocks, 30% is uh, big tech companies. That's why the P ratio is higher and the dividend yield is lower because a lot of these big tech companies like Alibaba, Meituan, they don't pay a dividend. That's why the Hansen index, the U, dividend yield doesn't look attractive, but the P E ratio and the price is really 25 years low already. That's why China is undervalued. But Europe, I don't think it's undervalued because of fundamental reasons. The energy crisis will cause a lot of this manufacturing to go under. Like Europe, their index, which is the FTSE 100, or the DAX, DAX is the German index. The DAX, you look at it, there's no tech stock. They don't have tech stock in their index one. Uh, for the Europe, their Gucci company is all those uh, engineering companies that like they produce your high-end stuff like yeah, that produce your aeroplane, uh, produce all, your, all those like, uh, equipment uh, for your manufacturing, those high-end equipment. Uh. So high technology, but more towards the engineering side. But because of the high energy cost, right, a lot of these factories are forced to shut down because the more they produce, the more they are loss making. So for Europe market, you cannot look at the PE ratio because a lot of them, they will become loss making and some of them, they will go bankrupt. Yeah, that's all. Just now you talk about uh fang stocks like Google, uh, Meta. Uh, what's your take on Amazon? Uh, since you are looking at you know e-commerce business, right, and, and cloud business, I think uh Alibaba and Amazon overlap. Yeah. So uh, Amazon, right? Yeah. yeah. A lot of people don't understand Amazon. Amazon, they look at the PE ratio, what fifty times, one hundred times. They think it's very expensive, but Amazon they purposely suppress their earnings down so that they don't have to pay tax. So Amazon they don't like to pay tax. Like the CEO salary one dollar, don't pay income tax. They just get the stock option. Same as Elon Musk, the salary is just one dollar. They don't want to pay tax. They get the stock only. So Amazon, the PE ratio looks very high because they suppress it by doing by taking all their earnings and do R and D to expand in different market. But if we remove that all this cost, right? The Amazon PE ratio at this moment is about twenty five times to thirty times their core earnings. That's why as a value investor, you must really dig into the financial statements and get the real earnings, earnings from an investor point of view. So at 25 times earnings, Amazon, I believe, is fairly priced. Uh, because Alibaba is just trading at 10 times earnings. Then Amazon is trading at 25, 30 times earnings. But Amazon, the thing, uh, the difference between Amazon and Alibaba right, is uh, they are strong and weak in different segments. Amazon is very strong in their AWS, their cloud business, whereas Alibaba, the cloud is not so strong in the international market. International market, uh, Alibaba ranked number four behind Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, whereas Amazon is number one in the global cloud market. But Amazon, the weakness is they don't have payment. Payment is still dominated by the other players because in US, people still use Master, Visa. They, they are not so used to digital payment. So both companies, they have their pro and cons. But Amazon, one thing I don't like about US market is uh, their delivery cost is very high. You make one delivery is $6. So when they do Amazon Prime and they give unlimited delivery, right? They deliver too much, they burn a lot of money. Then the thing with US market, right, is that their shipping ports are uh, their truck drivers, right? It's use a lot of human labor. They cannot do like fully on automated warehouse, they cannot do fully automated ports. In China, right, their warehouse and their port, right? No human one. Everything is machine move all the goods. But in US, because there's union, if you fully automate, the union will protest because you're not hiring anyone. Right? So they less a lot of unionization. That's why you cannot become fully automate in the US market. So both of them, the fundamentals is very different. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the comment. Uh <laughs> okay. Uh let, let's move on. I, I saw this. This uh, I think come from the same person. That we just see how how much. Yeah, we can the cover. EPS I explained. Yeah, it, yeah, this one I think you explained already. We skip, share, huh? Yeah. We skip this one. The first one. 
Let me read it out, then, then see whether, whether you want to skip it. Yeah. But so, you know, I look at 9988 past EPS, only 20 and 21 EPS greater than $6. The other years, erratic and miserable. I'm not sure how you get the $10 EPS, 10 cents more solid and with dividend. I think this one yeah. answered. Uh. Go yeah, ahead. so I, I say uh, the recurring uh, earnings is actually $8 per share, but you have to strip away all the loss-making unit. Then you yeah. can get the $8 per share. But then, uh, now Alibaba has started to do a lot of cost-cutting. They'll be more efficient. So the loss-making unit, right? Once they turn profitable, right? Mm. Let's say the groceries delivery, the community buying, the logistic and the Adi Cup, they start to turn profitable, then the EPS will become 250 per quarter. Then you will get the EPS of $10 per share. So $10 per share EPS is forward looking, like one or two years later. That's the forward earnings. Current earnings is $8 per share on a recurring basis. Okay. Yeah, shipping away the loss making unit. Uh. Yep. So this one, next one. Um, on same one, 9988 EPS, also many years, their earnings pump up by investment income, 2020 and 2021 pump up by 100%. That's why EPS can get $6, 2018 to 20 to 21, four years pump up. I think this is what I want to ask because I recall, I look at their numbers. Some years really, the investment income is very high. I think one of them, uh, the outlier is uh, there's some recognitions of the uh, N, N group or, or Alipay, right? So I think yeah. there's some recognitions of investment yeah. income as well. So, so you don't look at that. Uh, you basically just look yeah. at the core, core commerce, right? Yeah. So when they report earnings, uh, the good thing is they have a lot of different type of earnings. Mm. The reported earnings is very high in the past because of the one-time gains of this investment. Mm. But usually analysts, they don't see one. They always look at the adjusted earnings. Because adjusted earnings, then you can see the recurring earnings. So see. like now during bull market, right? The adjusted earnings, you can see $253 per share. That's because of the investment gain. But then during bear market like now, the earnings become negative also because of the investment losses. So uh, it will go, it will fluctuate up and down. Uh. Best is look at the recurring earnings from the operations. So, yeah. Yep. Then the $30 cash per share. Yeah, I yeah just this one I think now. you answered already. We'll yeah, just... Just, I calculate and show yeah. you all how to get twenty eight fifty per share. But some people will disagree. You can use the conservative method. Then you use, then you get only $10 cash per share because you believe that the stock bonds and property, they can be worth zero, ma. Your stock, you can crash to zero, ma. Your bond, you can default, you can be zero, ma. Your property, you can also be become worthless. So if you want to be conservative, then it's 10 or $15 uh, cash per share. If you want to be like me, la, I think from a owner perspective, then you can get $28.50 cash per share and you can pay this money out as a dividend from a... So the way I look at it is actually how Warren Buffett look at it. You look at, read the Warren Buffett books, la, this is called owner's cash, owner's earnings. Yeah, this is how we look at it. Yeah. yeah got it. Because Warren Buffett, when he buy a company, be it he own a 1% stake or be it he own a 100% stake, the way he analyze company is the same. He look at it from an owner point of view. Yeah. Answer. Okay, the next one. Uh, when will you deem that Alibaba is a sell? What is the deal breaker? Seems like you think everything is good. Yeah, so Alibaba, I tell you already, the core commerce business, right? You should hold it there. Then you will find growth from logistic, payment, and also the cloud. I will sell Alibaba, right? If uh, there's totally the other three units all gone case, like logistic business, they lose out to JD. Then, example, ByteDance, they enter into the payment market. People don't use Alipay. They use the ByteDance pay. Or then, example, uh, the AliCloud. AliCloud no, no longer the market leader. Uh, let's say the all the companies, they come out a new law. They say, all companies cannot use uh, private enterprise to cloud. They must use the Guo Ji Yun. They, China, they have Guo Ji Yun, which is actually the government cloud. So all the government, they can only use the government cloud. But if they force private enterprise to also use the government cloud, right, then Alibaba, the cloud business is destroyed already. So if that happens, my thesis will change. Then Alibaba becomes a sell. But I don't believe this will, 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 will happen. Lah. So you have to monitor lah. every quarter. You must really look at the fundamentals whether their logistic business, their cloud business, their payment business, are they still the market leader? If you lose your market leader position, you must ask, have the fundamentals changed? Yeah. Got it. So basically those uh, area that they are dominant, they have to stay dominant. No need to yeah. grow 50% every year, but at least they need to maintain the lead. Nah. If, if yeah. uh, disrupted, then we have, to re we have to review again. Yeah. Okay. Plus, uh, Alibaba, you look at it, uh, e-commerce, logistic, payment, and the cloud, they are all four markets, they are the market leader. Hmm. But if 
all of them, they no longer the market leader. Then what for you want Alibaba, right? I buy uh, Alibaba because they are the market leader. You're not the market leader, then people is stealing your business already. Then your fundamentals is too weak already. You cannot defend your position. Yep. So next one. Given the chance again, Master Leon will still all in Alibaba. Any lesson learned for your yeah. future investment? So if you ever watch the Marvel, there's one superhero, Doctor Strange. Oh, I can time travel back in time. Then when you <laughs> fight Thanos, you go back to 10 go back oh, 10,000 times, you only find one possibility. So if I had time walk oh, 10,000 times, right, I will still buy Alibaba. Because my 14 years of investing, I never seen before such a bullshit company so undervalued. And actually, it dropped 80% now. It's good for you because you can buy cheap. But whether you believe in Alibaba or not, because people who don't understand the China market, especially the are more YouTubers, they don't even understand Chinese. They cannot read Chinese. They cannot speak Chinese. They have never been to China before. So they don't dare to invest in Alibaba. For me, I've been to Beijing. I've been to Shanghai. I go to China five, six times already. I've traveled to China many times. I go there. People don't use cash. They use their phone to do the payment. Cashless is very high-tech society. I believe in the fundamentals. So I will still invest in Alibaba. But my mistake is uh, two. One is uh, my mistake is I use leverage. 1.5 times leverage. Number two is Alibaba crash 80%. Because I only believe that Alibaba can crash 50%. Because I look at the 2015 and the 208, the global financial crisis, Alibaba crashed 50%. So that is a false thinking. The false thinking that it can only crash 50%, but actually it can crash 80%. So if I travel back to time, I will still buy Alibaba, but number one, I won't use leverage. Number two, I won't do lump sum investing. I will take the 300,000, I will buy over one or two year period. So every month I'll buy 10,000, 15,000 and slowly buy it in it. So the moral story is dollar cost average. Or uh, if you don't know, don't time the market. Just slowly buy. Yeah. Yeah. Are you still on leverage now, by the way? Now, because uh, at the bottom right, when it crashed to sixty dollars, I cannot margin call because my leverage ratio jumped from one point five times to two times. So now the market, the thing ready up ready, right? My leverage ratio now is one point six times. So I'm still leveraged. But as the market go further, my leverage will drop. But after Kana burn already, right, I learned my lesson already. So my future, the DCA, right, every month I put 500 or 1,000, right? The new position, I won't take leverage. If I put $1,000, I'll buy $1,000 worth of BABA. Then I'll put it in the buy from the US market. Because US market, you can buy in smaller lot. I don't have money to buy in Hong Kong market. Because Hong Kong market, the 100 shares of Alibaba at $100 is 10,000 mm. Hong Kong dollar. That's about 2,000 SGD. I, I don't have the this bite size. My bite size more towards Baba in the US market. Yeah. I see, I see. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good learning, good sharing. Yeah. Uh, the next one, what do you think of Alibaba management? Do you think they are executing well given the current macro climate uh, and China macro? Yeah, so when we look at management team, right? Okay, let's I give you an example of an extreme example of bad management. Bad management is, uh, what you see, Twitter. Twitter, right? They actually, they are a cash cow, but the management, right? They pay themselves high salary. They over hire. They hire so many workers. You 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 fire eighty percent of worker, twenty percent of worker like Elon Musk, uh, they can still operate. So they are wasting your shareholder money. So management is no good. Then management very stagnant. They rely ninety percent of their revenue on advertising. They never diversify. They never expand the business. So Twitter is an example of bad management. That's why they are revamped. Then another example of bad management. Not say that anti Palantir lah. Palantir they print about fifteen to twenty percent of shares every year. So they dilute the shareholders a lot. That's an example of bad management. For Baba, right? When you invest in a company, I like to invest in companies that are listed for at least five or 10 years. So you can see the management track record. For Alibaba and Tencent, right? When they give share stock-based compensation, right? You have to compare it against the industry. For big tech companies, they generally, for the FANG stocks and those high growth stocks, right? The stock-based compensation is about 2 to 5% yearly. So every year they will print 2% to 5% new shares to give it up to the employees. Because the fan companies, they are very competitive. They want the best talent. So they give them high salary. They give them stock-based compensation to attract this talent. For Alibaba and Tencent, because they are very reputable, all the fresh grad, they want to join this company. So the management, they don't print so much shares. For Alibaba, they print about 2% new shares every year as stock-based compensation to give to the employee. For Tencent, they print only 0.5% shares every year. But Tencent, the model is different. It's more like a hedge fund. They take management fee every year. And if the performance is good, they take a performance fee. 
So that's why the Tencent, the share-based compensation is lower. But both companies, the management is very good because the compensation is fair. Then the second thing is look at the track record. Over the past 10 years, 20 years, yeah, the management is very good. Right? Because like now the Daniel Zhang, Jack Ma step off it. Daniel Zhang is full. Daniel Zhang is the one of the, initially when Jack Ma uh, formed the Alibaba, right? The initial stuff is called the Sipa Lohan. Sipa Lohan is the initial 18 managers that help run Alibaba to grow it from a small company until now, multi-billion company. So all these managers, they have 10, 20 years experience already. Uh, they are not hired from external one. It's all internal one. So they have a track record of growing the cash flow. Like from IPO until now, Alibaba, the cash flow have 4x. Or four, they grow their, uh, their cash flow by four times already. But then the stock price is still remains the same. So I believe management, they have performed well. But recently, the numbers is very bad. I cannot fully blame the management because they are doing their best already. Management now... For them, right, their compensation, half of their compensation is in cash. Another half of their compensation is SBC, stock-based compensation. So all the management, they are also shareholders, you know. They also want Alibaba, the share price, to go to the moon. If they can make the revenues and earnings go up, they also want the revenues and earnings. But they cannot because they already do their best. The macro environment is very weak due to the lockdowns. That's why this is the best they can do. But I believe that management, their interest is aligned with us. All the Sipa Lohan, they hold shares of Alibaba and they will try their best to make Alibaba grow the revenues and earnings so that the stock price can be higher. Yeah, that's all. Just now you mentioned Twitter, right? Do you think that this Elon, like Elon Musk taking over Twitter and make all sorts of changes, do, do you think that he's heading towards the right direction or, or not the case? Yeah, I think he's heading up to the right direction so that now a lot of fan companies, right? In the past two years, they become very stagnant. They don't innovate. So, example, you use like YouTube or use Google. What are the new features? Very few new features. Right? They're just doing the same thing. Then you use Facebook. They are doing the same things. Only like recently, yeah, the Instagram reels. So, they realize that they don't need such a big workforce. They can cut half the workforce. They can still operate. Then they realize the second thing is actually the big tech company, they lack innovation. Like you look at your iPhone. Two years ago, the iPhone and now the iPhone is still the same. I don't think they innovate much. Uh. So they have, they lack. So big tech companies, they realize two things. They don't need so many staff. Then number two, they lack innovation. So the next five years, the big tech companies, the culture will be different already. They will be more competitive and the workers, they will work harder. So the whole landscape for tech has changed already. This is a good thing for shareholders because you as a shareholder, you are a business owner. You don't want them to work from home every day slack. Then chit chat, then never do work, but you want them to work hard and generate the highest return for you. So this is good for shareholders. Huh? Yeah, exactly. So we will be more active on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, so Twitter, I believe they will change a lot. Lah. So going forward, Twitter, you might see like Twitter also going to short form video because the trend changed already. Like you look at Meta in the past, it's Facebook, you share your status, then it become Instagram, you share your daily picture. That becomes Instagram stories, which is a short picture of what you do today. Yeah. Then now we go to Instagram view. So the way we consume information, right? Instead of reading text, right? Nowadays, we watch video more. That's yeah. why I, I, I do YouTube. I'm a newcomer to YouTube. The Everybody same. do 10 minute video. YouTube I do shops. short form video. But I believe the trend is changed already. So in, in the future, right? People will still consume long form video. Like the video that we watch now, they will also watch. But they will also watch short form video. So, but people will read books less and people will read the news from the website also less. Yeah. Yeah. So you are very uh, advanced. Huh? Straight away go to the short form versions, which is the best yeah. one. <laughs> My, I, I'm still stuck at the long form. <laughs> yeah. But long form also can. So at the end of the day, you must do things that you're interested in. Lor. You must be passionate. Yeah. For me, I'm old uncle. I'm near, next year, I'm 40 years old. I don't know how to do the video editing. If I make yeah. a 10 minute video, I need to spend 10 hours to edit. I feel that it is like becoming like work. It's very mm. burdensome. But shorts for me is very easy to make. Yeah. yeah. So I also prefer like that now like that. We just chit chat and share. It's also good. Yeah. So so mm. good. So for long form video, my 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 style is I, I will just go to other people channel and just talk talk. Yeah. That's how I share my view. So in <laughs> the end, for video making, you have to be passionate. Oh, like I can see that you are very passionate also. Eh? Every week the talk talk sing uh, sing song session to do sharing. So to in order to be a content creator, you must be passionate and you can make this form of video. Yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, sounds good. I think this one, uh, let me read. Uh, how much did you actually lose on Alibaba in total, both realized margin call and unrealized? What's your average? Yeah, so like I mentioned, now, my average price is 140 to 150. I don't know how much realized loss, uh, but I never really count, but I lost one third of my portfolio. So one third of my portfolio is realized loss. Then the other two thirds, uh, the 9,000 shares, I'm still holding. Then now it's paper loss. So I need Alibaba to go back to $180, $200, then I can break even. So it's a long way there. Lah. But I believe, but although I have lost a lot of money, I have not given up in the stock market. I believe that value investing is still working. I'll continue my method, just that I might need two or three years to recover. So it's a very painful lesson, but uh, I will keep still putting money every month and slowly rebuild my the portfolio. Lah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, we see how well, so many more questions, I think, from the same 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 person. Eh. Do you, do you want uh, to cover all this or do we? Yeah, you, you we, we, we see, see, we see how much. Uh, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we pay Alipay, same thing. One of the most profitable segments of 700, 9988. Tesla shareholder get 100% of the business. Alibaba get only 30%. A lot of excuse for 9988. So, so what, what's your take on this? Also, in the past, right, because Alibaba, the Taobao shop, they do the payment, right, is to ensure the customers that they will not get scammed. That's why they do the Alipay as an escrow la, so that the money go into Alipay then when the the merchant gives you the goods confirm you receive already then the Alipay will release the funds to the merchant so it's like a middleman that's why Alipay was so successful but in the end because of regu- regulations they need the the payment system right to be at least 30% owned by the Chinese and foreign ownership can only up to uh, 70% that's why Jack Ma took a 30% stake of it or, or a 70% stake of the Alipay. Then for us shareholders, we only get a 30% stake because the majority of this stake has to be of the local Chinese holding. But then that's why the SoftBank is very unhappy. Wow, and financial so far, then SoftBank only own the 33% of it. So one of the underlying deal is that uh, in order to compensate uh, SoftBank and Alibaba shareholders, once M Financial IPO, there will be a cash bonus to Alibaba shareholders. So once M Financial, let's say next year or the year after the IPO, right, we will get rewarded. We will get the, the M Financial shares and we also get a cash bonus also. But in a sense, it's also unfair. On, on hindsight, it, it's better that we own 100% of the M Financial. But if you never give Jack Ma and the management team that half the 70% stake, right, they might not be so successful in the M Financial. The like M Financial, the market cap is very big. Eh? When the IPO is 300 billion market cap, eh? today Alibaba is 200 billion market cap. So let's say M Financial, we cut the market cap by half, 150 billion. So now M Financial and Group is 150 billion. Alibaba is 200 billion. That's how big M Financial is. So by taking the M Financial stake, right? let's say they place it out, like how Tencent, they give the Meituan and JD shares to their shareholder. If Alibaba give us the and group the shares, right? The ticker code is 6688. Lah. It's worth about 20 to 30 US dollar per share. So we can also unlock value. Yes, we could have unlocked more value, but it might not be have grown so big lah, for the end group. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, what's the uh, timeline? Uh, uh, because it has been quite some time since we last heard about um uh, this end group. Yeah, uh, group. Do you still plan to list on? Yeah, so the end group, they cannot IPO because they don't have the financial holding license. Because of, like you see the in China market, the four big banks, right? They are owned by CCP. All these are state-owned banks. So the big four banks, all they have like 30 to 50% shareholder is from the government, uh, the central bank, uh, CCP. Uh. So for Alipay, right? They are now considered as a bank also. They are the biggest digital bank in China. That's why the government, they took a 50% in the consumer arm. It's the consumer arm that controls the Zifu Bao, which is the Alipay. So the, the 50% stake comprised of uh, six to seven state-owned enterprises. They each own a five to 10% stake in the consumer arm. So basically, now the major shareholder of the M Financial is the CCP. So what it is really successfully in a... Uh, get the 50% stake already. So now they will apply for the financial holding company license. Once they get the license, then they can IPO. So indicatively, it's the end of next year, they should IPO in the Hong Kong market. 
But if it's delayed again, then 2024. But after the IPO, will they give us the shares as dividend? I believe so. Because uh, there's a conflict of interest between Alibaba and M Financial. Because M Financial is too powerful. Because now that like, you know, they promote the digital yuan. With the digital lens, yuan, they have so much data. They can track all your spending, all your spending habits. So if Alibaba has access to this data, they become too powerful. That's why Alibaba and N Group, they are separated. Both have to be independent. So Alibaba will give us the N Group the shares to divest away the entire N Group. So both of them will be two different companies. Alibaba Group and N Group will be separated. Lah. That's my view. Yeah. But I don't think Alibaba uh, shareholders will be happy with this, right? Because... Like, like you, you don't have to own 100%, like part of it owned by the government is fine, but at least you want to hold uh, a portion so that you can, because this is a very, one core, one of their core arms, right? When it comes to uh, fintech things, why, yeah. why should they uh, let go of this, right? Yeah, so in the end, I hope that they will give us the M, M group, the shares, law, like 6688, they take out a special dividend, just like 10 cents, what they're doing with the JD and Meituan shares. If they place it out, I'm happy because I can hold the end group the shares for long term to see the growth. What yeah. is what I do want is uh, they sell the whole end group away. They sell, example, they sell the end group, they sell to Huawei. Mm-hmm. Or oh, then, 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 then I will feel very upset. Uh. Then, then I believe that uh, I, I cannot con with you, I cannot cheat. It. <laughs> but I don't believe they will take this direction. Uh. But if they take this direction, it might be a reason to divest Alibaba. If they, they are forced to sell away the, the entire holdings in the end group. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I think let's go into, I, I'll be more selective of, of the questions. I think too many questions uh, come from the same person. So. Uh, this one I'd to ask you, how to check what price Buffett pays for TSMC? Seems like not reported, but can be higher than current price actually as bought in uh, 3Q. So do, do you know this? I, I, I think it's reported already. They spent 1.4 billion. So you look at the 13 more founding, than that, uh, right? About, yeah. Because the state is billion, about uh, yeah. 4 billion. Yeah. So so after they bought it, the price went up really. Lah. So you just look at the chart law, you just look at the third quarter. So third quarter, the lowest price or the highest price within that range. Mm. But they, we don't have the exact price one because they, they won't show us the exact price. Only the company know. They, they only report lah, how many they, shares they buy over the quarter. So nobody mm. knows their average price one. But mm. how people they backtrack is uh, they look at the balance sheet, how much cash they spend, and now the increase in the asset, which is the the mm. TSMC shares, then they backtrack, then they get a rough estimate of the average price. But you should not be concerned about the average price. Like for example, when Warren Buffett, they buy the OXY, which is the oil company, they, he did not buy over one quarter. He buy over the entire year. Every quarter he buy OXY. So he will, the belief is that he will keep buying the TSMC. He might even build up a 10 or 20% stake. So why he buy into the OXY and why he buy into the TSMC? So both he believes that both of these, they are commodity company. He believes that in the future, oil prices will be higher. Cheap prices will be higher. So it's a hedge against inflation. So in the future, right, oil and the chips is more expensive. It will hurt us consumers, but it will benefit Warren Buffett because he is the shareholder. So that is his bad law. So don't be concerned of the short-term price. Be concerned whether Warren Buffett will keep buying it over the next few quarters and will he build up a 20% stake. Then you look at the fundamentals, whether you understand TSMC, then you decide you want to buy also or not. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. I, I think this one also related questions. Um, seems that Ali yeah, Club got this problem. Just keep, uh, yeah. this, this one, no chips and customer shifting due to China, US. Uh, 998, all segments really had it. Chips is a big problem. I want to ask you this because I think uh, Alibaba, I think they are in the chip design yeah. as well. But when it comes to chip manufacturing, always got problem, right? I don't know what was the, what's their latest effort when it comes to uh, Semicon, the, the manufacturing partner. I, yeah, I think so, Huawei yeah. getting into it, right? Have you heard about that? Yeah. So for the China, right, they are throwing trillions of dollars to catch up in the chip race. So chips, there are three portions. One is the design. The second is the manufacturing. Number three is implementation, integrating. So design, right? Like Alibaba and the Bai Pi Ren, uh, they, they can make five nano chips already. But the weakness of China is the manufacturing. Manufacture to manufacture, you need those equipment like lithography, la, cleaning, la, how to make the set, uh, the chip, uh, the, the transistor as small as a sand. You take a sand, uh, star, uh, S-A-N-D, uh, a sand, uh, you make it into a, a transistor, uh, super, super small. You need the machine. And China, they cannot produce the machine. They actually buy the machine from uh, 
A ASML la. So ASML is the they manufacture these machines to do this pro the manufacturing process. They sell to this company. So China they probably will need like a few years to catch up in the manufacturing. For now they are still buying lah. But because of the ban right, they cannot buy anymore. But there's so what they do right is they actually circumvent this. They have a black market. Also they want to buy chips. They want to buy equipment right. They will buy from those other countries. For example, let's say you are Malaysia, you you are Croton, you sell car right then you car you need the chips so instead of ordering 100% for your car use right you order 150% you order extra chips then you the extra chips that you have right you sell in the black market you sell to China and you can mark it up by even 10 times so China don't have a chip problem they have a cost problem they can buy the chip from the black market from all these other Asia countries but the Asia countries mark it up very high that's why the China the EV company right they are all loss making only BYD is making money all the EV companies all losing money because they their expenses is too high. They have to buy the chips from the black market. Then same thing for Alibaba, that the, the cloud server, right? You build the server, you also need the chips to run the processor. They cannot produce the chips, so they also buy from the, from the black market. So that's why the cloud unit is losing money because the cost of chip is very high. So how to make money? Buy TSMC. <laughs> you produce chips, you make money. Right? So chips is a very important commodity. In, in fact, China, they export the chips value every year is more than the oil value. They export more chips than oil. So chips is the biggest commodity that uh, China is importing. Yeah, that's my sharing. Yeah, speaking of EV, um, this, this one we answered. Speaking of EV, we want to ask you about Tesla. What, what, why do you think Tesla will crash below $100? Not sure whether you have made video on this. I, yeah, I don't so, so that. Tesla, right? I, I told people that, oh, a lot of people hate me now because I'm very straightforward one. I say I just say directly. I don't mean my word one. I just share my view. Now I say Alibaba, good. You can disagree. I say, so I'm bullish on Alibaba, bearish on Tesla. Previously, I say crypto is uh, worthless and Tesla is overvalued because Tesla, a lot of people, they think it's a growth company. But the industry that they belong in, right, they are not selling a basic need. They are selling a, a discretionary a, a one. So during recession, like next year, we are going into a global recession. People, they will buy, their focus is on food and shelter. They will not cut their spending on food and shelter. But they might delay their purchase of a mobile phone. Maybe they two years later, then they buy the new iPhone. They will delay their purchase of a mobile vehicle. So they will not buy uh, Tesla. That's why this year, Tesla, they cut the prices by twice already. And there's rumors that they will cut the price by a third time. So for a lot of EV companies, right, during a recession, a lot of them, they will cut their prices because the demand is reduced. That's why Tesla, I believe the the P and the E, la, earnings will be reduced. They will make less money next year compared to this year. Then the PE ratio will also be reduced because I believe Tesla cannot sustain a 50% PE ratio forever. Just like example, last time, let's say uh, with your FANG stocks, they all in the beginning, their PE ratio is very high because the growth rate is very fast. But once their growth rate starts to taper down, they are only growing at 10% or 20% per year, the PE ratio will compress. So Tesla cannot sustain 50 or 100 PE ratio forever. The PE ratio will only come down. Let's say it comes down to 20 times PE ratio. Then Tesla makes the earning per share how much. Then you multiply by a 20 times PE ratio. Lah. So my belief is Tesla might crash 80% from the peak. Uh, so that is my bearish forecast. Lah. So I may be wrong. Lah. So yeah. good luck to you all. Because uh, I think during the most recent uh, uh, earnings call, there are, there are analysts that ask uh, uh, Elon Musk on what's the projected growth rate and he still say that 50% for the foreseeable future but didn't say how exactly how many years. Uh. So let's say we, we, we talk about let's say two, three, four years considered short term still, right? Do you, do you think uh, you said they will slow down? What was your expectation uh, in terms of their growth? Yeah, do you so, think that you go to negative? So like now, right? Because in order to hit the 50% growth rate, right? That's why they mark down their, their, their car prices. So if you want to hit revenue, it's very easy. You just sell your car cheap, you will hit the revenue target. As long as you sell cheap and you make a loss, people will buy. So actually, revenue growth is not a good indicator of the health of the company. You should look at the profit margin. Also, example, if you look at the sales, right? actually BYD is selling more shares than Tesla already. Also, you have to compare with the competitor. So Tesla, right? if they want to hit 50% revenue growth, they can do it just by reducing price. But long term, I believe uh, they will balance between 
sales and their earnings, the profit margin. Now. So maybe in future, the growth will become 20 to 30%. It will taper off for sure. Right? Maybe two, three years later. Yeah. So, so you think earnings will, will likely drop a lot, now, the earnings growth or, earnings, or the operating Yeah, or, operating earnings, profit. right. The, uh. the, 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 I believe 2023, right, Tesla and most EV companies will be loss-making. So usually during recession, right, cyclical companies, be it automobile, property, usually during down cycle, right, people don't buy house, people don't buy car. So usually for cyclical company, right, during downturn, right, their revenues will drop and they from profit making, they become loss making. So based on normal cycle, right, auto companies and property companies, they will be loss making in 2023 when the recession comes. So if Tesla somehow, uh, they make profit in 2023, uh, I don't know how. Uh, so, so maybe some way they will, they will find how to make profit. Like this year, they show profit, Part of their profit right, comes from that, the gains in their crypto, the, the carbon credit that they, they, that they sell to other, com- under other companies that like they sell the carbon credits to those old ICE companies. Uh. Oh, then they also have the subsidy from the government. So actually, all these incentives boost their earnings. So next year, if they report a profit, it's maybe because of the government subsidy or this. But you look at the core earnings uh, without the government subsidy, likely Tesla is loss-making. So when Tesla report uh, strong earnings, right? Don't be fooled by those companies. Don't look at the earnings also. You must dig deeper whether they got generate cash or not. Like a lot of shareholders, they ask Tesla to do share buyback. But why they don't do share buyback? If they have a lot of cash, they already do share buyback, right? Why, why they still need you to tell them to do share buyback? Because Tesla, right? Their cash flow is actually not strong. Like they built two factory, right? They actually burn a lot of cash. Then let's say Tesla, I think they have four or five giga factory, lah. Only the Shanghai Giga Factory is profit making and cash flow positive. The Giga Berlin, uh, Giga Texas, uh, all is loss making and cash burn one. Also, that's why they need to keep a cash war chest in, to keep their factories operating. That's why they cannot do share buyback. So a lot of people they they just follow blindly. The YouTubers say do share back, do share back. You have to study the cash flow and study the fundamentals. Then you can understand all this. Yeah. Yeah, this one I agree. Uh, because we have been looking at the good results in the past, right? Let's say really a recession comes. Let's say the number of cars so drop or cost yeah. blows up, something like that. I think uh, it will be very hard to manage if they don't have if they don't even have a decent amount of cash as a buffer. I think that one yeah. I totally totally agree. So uh, as a serious investor, have to look at the cash flow and look at the recurring earnings. Don't be fooled by the earnings that they post in the media. It's hmm. very easy to manipulate your earnings. To show that your earnings keep going. Yeah. yeah. So while we are on Tesla, one more question here. How can Chinese car makers be better than Tesla? Is the Chinese so good? Okay, so when you look at the EV company, uh, I'm not an EV expert, but I look at it from a layman. What's the difference between EV company and an uh, EV car and a normal car? It's two main technology. One is full self-driving and battery. Mm. Because the difference with the ICE car, the normal car, they cannot full self-driving one. The normal car, they also use uh, fuel. They don't use electricity. So you ask yourself, is Tesla the technology leader in battery and in the full cell driving? The answer to me is no. Uh, for Apollo Go under by two, they already level four full cell, full cell driving. They operate a fleet of 40 robo taxi in the tier one cities like Shanghai, Beijing, and Shenzhen. Oh, so they are doing 15 rides per day already. So they already on the ground full self driving because they are using LiDAR, light detection. Whereas Tesla is stuck at level two because they don't use LiDAR. They use camera technology. That's why they still stuck at level two. Then for battery technology, is Tesla the leader? The answer is no. In fact, Tesla is buying battery from BYD. They are buying battery from CATL. CATL, the latest battery, right, is twice the capacity, twice the range as compared to Tesla, the best battery. That's why Tesla is buying from them. So technology-wise, China has already surpassed Tesla. But the YouTubers will not tell you this. The YouTubers, when they talk about Tesla, they only talk about Tesla itself. They don't compare Tesla against the Chinese EV. So if you want to find a good YouTuber that do EV vehicle, he must compare the both. Then like I, and I present to you about Alibaba. I tell you, JD and Pinkdoto and Meituan, they are doing a better job. Their revenue growth is higher. So they actually outperform Alibaba. But I also explain to you why I will remain invested in Alibaba because of their other businesses. But you invest in Tesla, you still can invest. But you must understand what is the Tesla biggest advantage. The Tesla advantage right, is not in battery technology, it's not in full self-driving. It's in the marketing, the brand. 
people will buy Tesla and they will pay a premium is because of the brand to be associated with Elon Musk. If I buy a China car, can I get the Chobu to date me? No, what? they see me drive China car. But if I drive a Tesla, wow, people think I'm very sucky. The girl will hop into my car and will become my girlfriend. So it's the brand. It's the brand. That's why Tesla is towards the, should, they should target more towards the luxury method. It's the brand. No? So you must understand what is the Tesla competitive advantage. Then is that the reason for you to buy the company or not? Yeah. Yeah, I think this one is similar to Apple, right? I, I think there are still people who say, oh, if you use Android phone, it, it could be Samsung, it could be expensive, but you still don't have the Apple kind of feel, right? So so yeah. uh, that's the, the power of branding. Right? Yeah, so if yeah. you go out with a girl, right, then you hold Apple phone, wow, sucky, right? The latest, <laughs> you go out with a girl, you hold Xiaomi phone, $100 phone, the girl, will, after first date, will meet you the second time already. So it's about branding and image, sure. So, Apple, the branding is very strong. Like Warren Buffett, he buy into Apple is more like a consumer stock. How he buy Coca Cola, because no matter what, people recognize the brand, they will still buy it, You yeah, know. Yeah, I think we are two hours already. I think too long. Uh, I I really thanks a lot to yeah. uh Master Leon for all the sharing here yeah, and all, yeah. all those who submit the questions. So, uh, we won't go through all of them. Maybe yeah. in the chat we can we can continue or even yeah. in in future sessions uh. But yeah, I just want but, to close uh, it. Yeah. No. Uh, maybe I'll that, come uh, back again. Uh. So, yeah. so you all don't worry. The questions <laughs> don't answer. Never mind. Maybe yeah. every quarter or what, on and off, I will come in and answer your yeah. question. Mo- I'll be back. Yeah. It won't, it won't be the last time you all see me. So don't worry. <laughs> yeah, most importantly is your... Master Leong enjoy the session. Then we'll come back again, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, my, so my, my closing statement, uh, maybe I'll give a closing statement. Yeah. Uh, I just want to share. So the market has already crashed. Everybody is very upset. Also, maybe you lose money in crypto, maybe you lose money on Tesla, maybe you lose money on Chinese tech. So like people lose money in crypto, they blame the Luna, Tenera, the Doquan, they scam them. They lose money in Tesla, they blame Elon Musk. They lose money on high growth tech, ARKK, they blame Katie Woods. So there's a lot of negative energy now. Everyone, they don't blame themselves, they blame everyone else. But end of the day, you have to take responsibility for your own investment. Now, I lose on Alibaba, you will see me blame Jack Ma, you will see me blame CCP, I don't blame them. In the end, I invest my own money, I can only take responsibility of my own portfolio. So, hope everyone uh, can be more positive. Well. So, money lose already can earn back. Don't, don't, don't stress yourself up. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Yeah. Uh, sounds good. Good sharing there. Uh, maybe just one more last question. This one too too interesting. I need to ask this question, sir. Yeah. If you start family, will you get a job or you intend to be by yourself and just watch shows and play game every day and not want yeah. to have a family? So so if I start family, right, definitely I have to get a job. Uh, because like for me, right, I, I, I alone, right? I let's say I lose a lot of money on Alibaba, I can lead a simple lifestyle. But if I got mm. wife, I got kids, right? Well, I cannot let my baby suffer, right? If I have a kid, you want them to have a good life. Have the best code, have the best education. Definitely, you have to work very hard uh, to support the family. So, if I have a family, definitely, I maybe I'll definitely do a full time job. Or, but now I'm single. I like you see, uh, like I say, single my available. health. Yeah, single. So, I, I just want to do the things that I, I'm happy about. Or follow my passion. Or that, that's why. Uh, so, so like I don't depend on my the portfolio to cover my expenses. Uh, so I depend on my rental income to cover my expenses and I lead a very simple life, go hiking, then talk on YouTube, then write articles on Substack, then come to this channel to share my market. So this is something that I'm passionate about. So you see, I can talk for two hours. It shows how passionate that I want yeah. to share already. So at the end of the day, right, you should do what you are passionate about. Then to start family or get job, right, it is called Tian Yi. It happens, you see fate. La. La, yeah, la. Like now you see Alibaba lose $200,000. Who want to marry me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So hopefully someday, when my portfolio is more successful and let's say I, I, I become, let's say my YouTube is successful or my stuff that is successful, I have more income, then I will start a family. And same for you all. Yeah. Hopefully that you all, now the stock portfolio, everyone is doing very badly, but the bear market will not be for everyone. The bull market will come back. Don't sell everything and, and get out and pull 100% cash. You must learn to endure. Hmm. Through the market cycle, you will gain experience and learn about the stock market yeah like that no? yeah i think yeah uh, it's not like uh the goal may not be important it's the journey right we all learn learn together yeah. we all i mean with a growth mindset uh, so we improve ourselves uh, and 
and what together. Lah. So I think I uh, don't want to take up too much time. It's really too long already, two hours. So thank you so much, uh, Master Leung, for coming to the show. Thank you, thank you. I hope okay, that welcome, we will, welcome. Yeah, yeah. we'll do this session and I, I might want to join you on the hiking session as well. Do a healthy <laughs> lifestyle. <laughs> healthy lifestyle, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So like, like, like nowadays, everybody very stressed. Don't keep looking at the stock market. Sometimes go and hike, go and see nature. Yeah. yeah. Because no matter... You, how you stress, how you keep looking, right? the stock price will not go up. It will take time for the stock price to recover. Yeah. Yeah. So just give it time and eventually the market will recover. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Then we end, uh, end the show here. Okay. Okay. Thank take you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.